Your voice matters. Your voice is a powerful tool. Your voice can change the world. Throughout history, people have used your voice to create change. Your voice can be used to whisper, or it can start a revolution. Never be afraid to speak up. Speak loudly. Speak boldly. Just speak. The mentorship program of the Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth is proud to present the 2021 Power of Voice Youth Conference. Welcome. 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 Welcome to the Power of Voice. We are so happy you are here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Youth Conference Power of Voice 2021. I am Bea. And I am Gio. And, and we, we are your, your host, host for, for today. today. All right. Before we get started with the program, we just wanted to give you guys some housekeeping rules on Zoom. So first of all, as you can see, your live captions may be on. You do have the option to turn that off. So go down on your Zoom bar, click live captions, and you can see says disable live captions, and you can disable that. And we also please respect everyone in the chat. Um, this is this conference is for you guys. So. If you guys type anything inappropriate, you will be kicked out. Fair warning. And also, for those that have received their swag bags, please check out those lesson plans and resources on your bags. And now I will pass it on to Gio for your three R's. Thank you, Bea. And everyone, always remember your three R's. Respect yes. yourself, respect others, and of course, respect the environment. Yes. So Bea, would you like to do the honor to introduce the theme for this year's Power of voice. Why, yes, of course, Shio. So this year's theme for our conference is fostering resilience and connecting diverse youth leaders. So this has been a very, very hard time for us due to the pandemic. And because of all the things that have happened, we want this theme to represent the resilience and the strength of our youth. I personally like this year's theme, Bea. It was honestly true that it was really hard when the pandemic hit us, mm -hmm. not just here in Canada, but around the world. Yes. And fortunately, we are back with the power of voice, yes. stronger than ever. Woo -hoo! So for today's event, we have prepared so many great things to all of you, from diverse and talented youth performers Woo! to inspiring guest speakers. Bea. And of course, not the last but not the least, yes. to our passionate facilitators. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. So I am just so excited for this event, Bea. Aren't you excited? Yes, I am so, so, so excited. All right. So not just that, Gio, mm -hmm. but we also have really great door prizes Ooh. with each one of them, including a $20 gift card from Co-op that you could use to buy your healthy groceries. <laughs> so everyone stick around and you could be one of our lucky winners. Woo, that is so interesting. Yes. I can feel it. I'm pretty sure Bea can also feel it. I can definitely feel it. That all of you there in your screens are so excited mm -hmm. for this event. But of course, before we begin, we would just like to express our gratitude to our funders, including IRCC and community partners for their continued support for, for them this event becomes a reality. Yes. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, Bea, let's not keep the people waiting over there, right? <laughs> yes, we should not. <laughs> All right, so every year, we start off our youth conference with the land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. So everyone, let's pay our respect to the, to the land that we are on by watching this video. Yes. What is land acknowledgement? Those of us that are continuing our oral history are blessed. What we shared, that was told from way back. We were part of the ecosystem. We were not masters of it. You know, after we grow up from our biological mothers, the earth becomes our caregiver. Everything that we need is there. Well, we were raised to believe that everything has a spirit, and that everything around us is alive and has a purpose. 
the spirit of the lamb and our spirit. You can't separate lamb and people. In Treaty 7 territory, I'm accepted, I'm something, and I'm with my people. We honor our ancestors by acknowledging Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the Treaty 7 nations, the Pikani First Nation, the Siksaga First Nation, the Ghana First Nation, Stony Nakoda First Nations and the Sutina First Nation. We acknowledge the ancestral territory of the Siksigaitsitipi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, and the home of Metis Region Number Three. All right, and thank you. That was a very powerful video to acknowledge the land that we are on. And now to kick off our event, let us please welcome the CEO of the Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth, Umashni Reddy, for her welcome message. My fellow conference delegates, I wish to welcome you to the 2021 Power of Voice Conference. I officially declare the conference open. This event is taking place virtually on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy and home to the Treaty 7 First Nations and home to the Métis people of Métis Region 3. Fostering resilience, connecting with diverse leaders. What an absolutely brilliant theme for this year's conference, given our new reality. As I set the context for my talk, I wish to address a few important matters. COVID-19 wreaking havoc to the health and economic well-being of people all around the world, displacing humanity from its natural way of living. Systemic racism, structural racism, racial inequality, marginalization and underrepresentation has been around for decades. It is time, my friends, that we use the power of our voice and speak up. Global warming and climate change, these are really, really important issues and we need to make a concerted effort in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. Information, communication and technologies, the world of automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence is here to stay. Now, my young friends, what role can you play in all of this? This is the world that your brilliant minds are operating within. Build and foster your resilience to thrive. Connect with the right people like your friends from the mentorship team. Learn from these smart, passionate, empathetic individuals. Develop resources, skills, and knowledge. Apply lessons learned. Become a young thought leader. Every skill or lesson learned in life is never, ever wasted. Diverse thinking, discourse and dialogue, and vibrant conversations come from a long line of diverse leaders who serve humanity. And believe you me, you are all leaders in your very own right. You are citizens of this new economy. Take calculated risks. Continue to be creative and innovative. Assert the rich values that have been instilled in you. Your leaders, your teachers, your mentors are the people that instill these values. Now is the time for action. This world is ready for you. Every human being has a right to be on this universe and share this land. We call Mother Earth with the first people of Canada. You are the masters of your own universe. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. Take a leap of faith. 
connect with your diverse communities, use the power of voice to make an impact, join youth movements, but always remember, maintain respect in the way you articulate yourself. As I'm about to conclude, I wish to leave you with some salient points. Remember, never ever lose sight of your rich values, your rich culture, your identity and your heritage. This is what makes you astute young men and women that contribute and will be contributing to diverse and multicultural Canada. Walk proudly, my friends, walk robustly. You have learned from the very, very best. To my friends, remember, continue to aspire to inspire with the power of your voice. This is the only way we can make a difference if we have our voices heard. To my dear friends in the mentorship team, why am I not surprised you have outdone yourselves. Congratulations on this beautiful event. To IRCC, all CBFY staff, all community partners, thank you for making the signature event possible. Bravo, well done, thank you. Thank you so much, Imashini, for the wonderful message. Now, Bea, for our very first guest speaker of the day, we have Gote Antinye. So a little bit of Gote is, I think, he's an 18-year-old Canadian striker. 18-year-old? Yeah, and he's originally from Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. But he is born in Benin. Ooh. Yeah, and then he first moved to Ledbridge and moved to Calgary. Mm -hmm. So you can see the transitions in there. Yeah, right? it is. Calgary, always Calgary. <laughs> and did you know that he used to play for local Eastside Memorial Food club, Ooh. but now I believe he plays for the locomotive Leipzig in Germany. Germany, Germany, no international player, isn't it? Oh my gosh, <laughs> from Calgary to Germany. I know. That, wow, guys, that kid is so good. We're making it big now. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> Gote is here with us today to share his journey. So, without further ado, let's all welcome Gote and Tinye. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Gote, and uh, I'm here to share with you basically uh, my journey of how I got, how I became a professional footballer in Germany. And uh, for me, it's, you know, it, it was exciting for me. But ever since I was younger, I always wanted to be a professional. Every I don't know, I would dream every day of seeing the big stars play, and I I just I wanted to be like them and play at the highest level. And uh, moving to Germany was you know was a little it was it was exciting at first but it it's kind of it's kind of difficult there's a there's a lot there's a lot to it you know? but and while time goes you 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 get you get through it and it becomes easier and it's it's good but um yeah um basically uh i used to i moved from nigeria to to canada when i was about seven six and was moved to left bridge alberta played for cold for a little bit then um moved uh moved to calgary and then started playing for Eastside Memorial, you know, good club, great bunch of guys, good staff, good coaches, Lou and Senior Rupin Jr., good guys, you know, learned a lot and, you know, played a couple years from there. Um, 
then moved to the Highlanders in BC, which uh, which pretty much, you know, was another big step because I was leaving home and no family, like leaving home, leaving my family, leaving my friends, going to going to another another going to another city to play and you know it was it was good like of course um of course it was a little bit hard for my family because my mom especially because um she didn't want she didn't want to see she didn't want to see um see me leave but of course she was happy see me leave and she knew it's what I wanted to do but um yeah uh playing BC for two three years with coach Vikram and Thomas good coaches learned a lot from there one of a couple trials in Germany but then I was, I was young. I was, you know, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to because in Germany there's, there's a lot. But um, yeah, um, basically, uh, after I got to Germany, my first week, my first week we. My first day, actually, um, we played a game, and I just wasn't sure if I wanted to be in Germany. You know, yes, I wanted to be a professional, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay. But um, the first day, we played a game, and I did really well, and the coach liked it. And one week passed, and two weeks and then after that they offered me and yeah I was I was excited because it's, it's all it's all it's all I ever wanted was to sign a contract and it's just all I ever wanted and it was a dream come true and yeah that's, that's my journey <laughs> Gote, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. This is amazing what you have gone through and how successful you've become. And for all of our registrants, if anyone has any questions, please put pop them into the chat um, so that Gote can answer our questions about his journey, about his skills, anything you want to ask him, please go ahead. Okay, Gote, so we've got our first question. What was your favorite thing about Germany? Uh, I would say the football. You know, I, I I love the football in Germany. It's it's very it's very aggressive. I would say. Awesome. Uh, what was moving to Germany like? From so that first question was from Brianna. This one is from Caitlin. What what was it moving to what? What was moving to Germany like? Yes. Um, it was it was hard. I would say there's sometimes when like I think actually I want to go home, but it gets better. It just gets better because you're in Germany, you're playing soccer, and I mean, yeah, there's no family with you, but it's it, it gets better yeah for sure i'm sure it's a, a mix of feelings but you're living your dream which is really awesome uh ashley asks 
what is one piece of advice that you would give to youth that want to become professional football players? Honestly, I, and I've been told this as well a bunch of times, is just work hard. Work hard, work on your touch. The touch is the most important thing. Your first touch, receiving the ball, first touch, and working hard every day. It's the most important thing, I'll say. Awesome. Some really good advice. Nicole asks, what was it like moving from Nigeria to Canada and then from Canada to Germany? Uh, when I moved to Canada, I was, I was young, so I don't really remember that much, but I was, I was young. But um, it was like a, it was a bit different. But um, I mean, Canada was a bit different because I've never heard of snow. But <laughs> yeah, and um, went to Germany was more different because the language and the and like wow, it's like another challenge, and I I don't even I don't even speak German. I don't even know German, but yeah, it was, it was different. different. Yeah, I'm sure you're great at adapting to new places with how much you've moved around. So this one's just a comment from Shams. That was great, Gote. Thank you very much for sharing. I'm now more excited to achieve my dreams. So look at you inspiring people up in this conference. Um, How many hours per week do you practice? Kathy asks. Um, for right now, because, um, the, the lockdown we have in Germany, we're only training three times a week and two hours. So, but what was usually it like prior to the oh, lockdown, um, we train every day mm. X plus games on the weekends, sometimes on the weekdays. But it would train every day. And yeah, it was just, it was perfect. Hopefully you can get back to that really soon. Uh, Ezram asks, who's your favorite player? My favorite player? I would say, I have two favorite players. One of them is Cristiano Ronaldo because um, he's the definition of working hard. And he's just, he's just, wow, when I see him play. And my other favorite player is Phil Foden. He plays on Manchester. And yeah, he's, he's just a baller. And he's a young guy just like me. And yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Okay, Basan asks, what is an interesting thing that you like about Canada and why did you choose to move here first to Canada? Um, uh, One interesting thing. Mm. Um, I would say I don't really know, but <laughs> the, my my parents. I would have to ask my parents that one because I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Well, I think uh, Germany sounds really interesting too. Um, Okay, so our next question is from Krishnita. Did you have a hard time adjusting to the cultural differences in Germany compared to other places that you've lived? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, in Germany, um, yeah. Because it's like some of my teammates uh, after like a game, um, 
after the game, they would they would get they would get some beer and drink, but I I don't drink, and they'll keep going, and the next day we have like training, but it doesn't it doesn't affect them, so it was like there's no way I could <laughs> drink that much, but like um yeah, that was a kind of a surprise to me, and I just think Germany was was difficult as well. I'm I'm still adjusting to it because I still have to learn the language and um the food and everything. Just yeah, still adjusting. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh yeah, that that sounds pretty normal and with time I'm sure you'll get the hang of it. Um, Scott asks, what was it like when you knew that scouts were coming to watch your games and how did you deal with that pressure and still perform? Um, when I was, when I was playing with Isai Memorial, um, we, we won, we won provincials. I remember we won provincials, the old tooth, and then, um, we're going on national and I remember this coach from White Caps game. I was watching our games, and like, um, honestly, when you're on the field, you just you just want the ball every time. And like, whenever you have the ball, you just have to like, you just have to like, you know want to do something with the ball and for me every time I'm on the field like there's no pressure no pressure because things happen on the field and you know and you just you just you just do do what you do Totally. Um, okay, at this point, we're getting so many questions. People are so interested in you and your journey, but we only have a couple of minutes left with Gote here. So I'll, I'll just pick a couple of more questions. One of them is from Ope. How were you able to stay true to yourself and what makes you want to keep going? Uh, well, what makes me want to keep going is because um. There's been so many times that I just want to like quit, but I can't because if I quit now, I won't know what happens at the end. But just keep going, just keep going to the end and then see what happens because anything can happen. So just have to just keep going. Keep going. Does to me like um doesn't matter how many times you just want to quit, but you can't. Not yet. Just have to see see what happens and just keep going. Keep going. Oh, that is some really fantastic advice, Gote. Thank you so much. I think we'll stop there on a really great note. Um, I'm sure that everyone has learned so much and we're so, so grateful that you've joined us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gote, for that amazing story and just for being transparent with us. That was really inspiring. Um, and thank you also EMFC for introducing Gote to us. Now I feel like trying out soccer gear. I don't know. <laughs> I know, Bea. You should actually try it. I believe in you 100%. And you're, you're going to be so good at soccer. <laughs> so everyone, keep an eye on Gote because he's already been, already been traded to play soccer in Germany. So yes. me, Bea, would not be surprised if one day we're going to see him playing at the FIFA. World Cup. Oh yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. You know what, Bea? We are so close to giving up and to giving out another 
our first door prize for yes. today. So I think since we just have Gote as our first guest speaker, I think it will just be very fitting to give something out related to him. So my partner here, Bea, <laughs> is going to showcase us a soccer ball. Yes. <laughs> All right. Plus a CBFY <laughs> shirt. Woo. Woo. And here. of course, a watch. A watch. But, <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> Don't just get excited yet. We have a lot more. A gym bag. Right here in the backpack that I can't really get. <laughs> the water bottle from YMCA. And of course, some of course, some fun items and delicious snacks. Mm -hmm. So if all of you right there in your screen are willing to get these awesome prizes, make sure you put your name on the comment box below. Or on the side. On the side, maybe it's <laughs> maybe better. It's on the side on yeah. Zoom, yeah. Whenever you put it, just make sure you put your name. So yeah, so right now we're just gonna wait for our lucky winner. Yes. As we wait for the names. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. everyone please put your names again down on the side below. And I mean, who doesn't want to get this? Look at this! It's a cash a show. Watch. <laughs> crazy! Very crazy. You know what? Since you, you said, you told me that you want to try soccer, you, know, no, you should no. put your name. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I am not doing that. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> okay, but may I just say that um, I think we have our winners. All right. Uh, we actually have already a winner. Let's all congratulate Abdel. Congratulations, Abdel Abolewali for that and just in case you don't know what to do and how to claim your prizes just wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you yes all right so yes please um abdel wali please uh just keep an eye out for your dms and your private message and your youth worker will be in touch with you very very shortly to receive this wonderful prizes all right <laughs> and we are not done there yet folks we have more 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 so who is ready for some performances i am so ready babe. yes okay so <laughs> first we have love Preet, ekam simran and azmita from nelson mandela high school to show us a wonderful Bollywood dance. Let's give it up for them. Woo! Ye bhi na jaane, wo bhi na jaane, nano ke rang, na na jaane. जो संग तेरा उड़ा पतंग मेरा हवा में होके मलंग जग की कोई रीत न जाने मैं तो बस तेरी हुई दीवानी मिला जो संग तेरा उड़ा पतंग मेरा हवा में होके मलंग छुड़ाई घर बार मेरा मखना वे मखना तू ही है संसार मेरा मखना वे मखना Yeah. 
That was so awesome, ladies. Thank you for the wonderful performance. But before we proceed for the next one, let's all have a quick video from the Calgary Bridge Foundation of Youth Own Advice, you own Youth Advisory Council yes. and a message from our partner organization. So let's check out this video now. Yeah. From Youth Central. Hi, Hi guys. guys. We are the Youth Advisory Council, also known as YAC. Our mission is to create a space for youth to have a voice within the mentorship program. If you have any ideas to contribute and help us improve in the mentorship program, contact us and we'll share it with our youth council. We work with youth workers like Tazneen, Blue, and Maria to make an immigrant and youth-friendly environment for the mentorship program. There are three committees. The first one is the community and social justice led by OPE. Event planning led by Hira. And program development committee led by Jermel. We would love to hear your ideas to improve the mentorship program. Contact us at YAC underscore mentorship on our Instagram. I see connection as something that is meaningful for everyone. It is a type of link that allows us humans to show our unguarded selves and share different or similar mindsets. For me, connection is like an invisible string between people that share the same likes, dislikes, and experiences. To me, connection is how my world changes and impacts others from our interactions. For me, connection is the foundation of every relationship. Being able to express your feelings and thoughts with people you know you can count on. For me, connection is being able to trust the person you're connected to. It's being able to show them who you really are without worrying about being judged or ridiculed. Connection for me is the invisible bond that we have with one another such as being friends, being teammates, being with our family members or as a group working together. Connection for me is the ability to be vulnerable with someone and know that you won't be judged for that. Connection for me is to care for someone even if you don't know them and trying to help each other out in hard times. For me, connection is what survives after any type of relationship. And the ability to connect is what holds the bond of any type of relationship together. Connection to me is the idea of creating healthy relationships and to find people that you can trust. Connection to me is the uh, fact that it's the unbreakable bond between you and another person, such as your close family and friends. Connection for me is a sense of belongingness towards a community or a group of people. My view on connection is building bridge between two people and finding common ground. Breaking news from the U Central News Office. We actually don't have a news office. We just thought it'd be a fun intro that we could do. Uh, I'm Danny. I'm from U Central. Uh, we are a Calgary-based organization that help youth get aligned with volunteer opportunities and different kind of programs that we offer. So they are youth-led programs as well. So we have a ton of different amazing programs, and then we also have really cool volunteer projects. What is U Central? You might be asking. Even if I kind of described it there. Might need a little bit more information. So our focus is you. So what we are looking to do is to empower you and to build and find your community. Youth Central has a lot of awesome programs that we offer that are youth led. So we have a ton of opportunities for youth to get involved. So you getting involved in the community of Calgary here. Uh, we're partnered with about a hundred different organizations. Uh, so there's a lot to pick from when it comes down to your volunteer project. Uh, and it helps me helps get you to meet like like-minded individuals that are inter interested in the same things so you're meeting a lot of youth that are the same age that are all from all over calgary so kind of building that you're having a great experience you can put this stuff on your resume as well so it can help you find a part-time job but it can also open up some other doors when it comes down to maybe figuring out what you want to do for a career plus you have a little bit of fun while you're at it which is always good right we also have programs that kind of align with other people everybody's interests so we kind of touch base on everything so if you're interested in stuff like journalism 
or maybe photography or creative writing, we have Youth Are Awesome. So that is our program that is our blog. So if you're interested in that, it's a great thing to sign up for and kind of gets you out and about in Calgary and getting to see new things and experience new things and meet people that enjoy doing that as well. Uh, we also have our steer committees. So these are youth-led as well. Um, so we have Yoda. So that's our Youth of Distinction Award. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check out our website. And then we have the Calgary Youth Foundation. So if you're looking for some funding uh, for a youth-driven project within your community, we do offer up to two thousand dollars for a youth driven project so definitely look at that we have our deadline coming up here in march uh, and then we have mayor's youth council so if you're interested in learning more about how calgary works and meeting more youth that are involved uh, in that kind of stuff it's a really good program to sign up for um, and we start recruiting for that in august so if it's something that you're interested in and you don't you can't get interested right now or get involved right now uh, you could definitely look out for that in August uh, and do an interview process. And if you get picked, you get to hang out with 21 like-minded youth that enjoy the same stuff. So if this is stuff that interests you, please, 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 please go check out our website. So it's www.ucentral.com. Uh, we have tons of really good information on there and also has all the stuff like our deadlines, um, program information, and it also has just other stuff too, how to sign up and everything like that. So if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to contact us, uh, info at ucentral.com. And that's also on our website. Hope you guys are all having a really good day. And thanks a lot for tuning in. Awesome. Thank you, YNC and Youth Central. All right. So we have the second door prize of the day. Are you all ready? Okay. So for this door prize, there will be four winners. Okay. Four. Therefore, more chances to win. So everyone comment your name again on the side uh, chat box. And we will be giving giving you guys everything that is on this table. So, Gio, what do we have here? We have a tie-dye kit over there, guys. So yeah. if you're very artsy, and you like doing it of course we won't let you down because we're going to give you two a shirt. FY shirt over here yes okay so this is just for one packet guys okay so again there is four winners so please just comment down your name and you will be getting everything in here so again oh my gosh like what you said with the tie-dye kit i remember when i was in high school and i wa i was very interested <laughs> in tie-dye but i never knew how to make uh, how to make it or how to get a tie-dye kit and like I mean, that's like coming here as a new president in this country. I didn't know that there was such kits. So <laughs> <laughs> I would just like paint and, you, you know, like those things on the um, with the names that you just write down on the shirts and everything like that. Wow. So that's usually what I would always do. Not tie dye, but there's still something. <laughs> well, Bea, I think I'm more innovative than you. Honestly, when I was like in <laughs> high school, what I did was I used rubber bands to to um, wrap those shirts mm -hmm. and then just deep it right in after it looks like a Joe Boos shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, the instructions are in the back anyway, so if you guys... Really interested in tie dye kit, make sure you comment your name. And I think, Bea, we already have our first winner. Yes, Gio, <laughs> so... I think our first winner and this first prize goes to Marielle Ocampo. Woo! Congratulations, Marielle Ocampo. Just to make sure, if you if you don't know how to claim it, just wait for a youth worker to get in touch with you. Yes, so just wait for them. And of course, I believe that we have another winner. So that's one out of four. And the next winner that we have is Simran Navid. Woo! Congratulations, yes! Simran Navid. Woo, woo, woo. Okay, and I think we're ready for our third winner, Gio. Oh, yeah, actually, I just want to say about to Simran is that just wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you. So you don't have to worry about where to get it, how to get it. They're going to be in touch with you, yes. Simran. <laughs> I think the third winner and third prize goes to Nader Saeed. Yes. Congratulations, Nader Saeed. And just what I said to Simran, always just wait <laughs> for a youth worker to get in touch with you for your prizes. They will, they will DM you. Don't worry about it. Okay. And for our last but not the least winner of this prize is Flavia Antelo. Congratulations to Ooh. all of our winners. Thank you, winners. Congratulations. Yes. All right. So congrats. All right, and and again, Flavia and Tello, please, 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 um, just wait for your DM from your youth worker. They will be in touch with you very shortly to receive all these amazing prizes. Congratulations again to those four winners. We have more coming up, people, later, so be sure to stay tuned. All right, and for now, our next guest speaker, Erica Adevohai, an alumni oh, from the of the mentorship program. So yes, <laughs> yes, she went to Notre Dame High School. She was passionate about peer mentor and an act. Youth Advisory oh, wow. Council member. 
She is here today to inspire us and share her journey with everyone. So let us welcome Erica. Hello. Hi. Okay. Give me a second here. <laughs> Technology is great, isn't it? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to share my journey about sickle cell anemia. Uh, yeah. So, if resilience is the ability to recover quickly from difficulties, and that in turn makes a person strong, then who am I? What makes me strong and resilient? And what makes me, me? As introduced, my name is Erica Adebakai. I was once a part of the mentorship program and I moved here from Lagos, Nigeria four years ago. First as a mentee in grade 10, then as a mentor in grades 11 and 12. And I was also a member of the Youth Advisory Council. Now, I'm a second year university student at Mount Royal University, hoping to switch my majors to education. I'm a daughter, an older sister, a friend, student, and a sickle cell anemia patient. I have a few minutes to share my story with you all and talk about my journey so far with this medical condition. At six months old, I was diagnosed with a lifelong medical condition known as sickle cell anemia. Like the name describes, my red blood cells aren't quite normal in that they die off easily and they're sickled in shape. They also get stuck in my blood vessels, which causes what you could call a block, like a traffic jam, one that happens inside me, <laughs> fun times. These traffic jams leads to painful episodes, often called sickle cell crisis. If I get too hot, too cold, too tired, or too stressed, sometimes crises just happen, and I don't know why. These are the causes of the crisis. A normal day can end with me in the back of the ambulance or curled up in my room trying to find a comfortable position so that I could to stop myself from, having, from feeling any pain. I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories of the hundreds I have walked away in my head. At my high school back home in Nigeria, we had a nurse's office. And I remember so clearly having to be carried down by another student. Now, one thing about me, I was a shy person. I was nervous. Ask anybody who was here when I was a mentee. I would not talk to anybody. <laughs> so imagine this shy, nervous kid being carried to the nurse's office with tears streaming down her face, crying, barely able to stop myself from crying out loud in pain when every other student was up, out, and about. Yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> um, I have many more scenarios like that happening. When I was 15, my family immigrated from, from, like, from Lagos to Canada to provide a chance at a better future for my siblings and I, and to also have access to better health care. My crisis, however, they didn't get any less frequent or painful. The one where I'm in red, that was me in Nigeria. And the one, the other one, that was me in November. I'm a patient at the Foothills Medical Hospital Rare Blood Clinic. My life now, as it did back in Nigeria, has to do with a lot of daily medications I take. Throughout high school at Notre Dame, I would have ambulances that would come quite often. And I would find myself at the back of those ambulances time and time again. I suffer from physical blows as well as mental ones. And for a while, I would stay up crying myself to sleep. My life with sickle cell has been a ride, as one usually is. <laughs> After hearing stories and reading online about people who have died from this disease, I often wondered if this was going to be my last time. And sometimes I will admit that I wanted it to be. I would snap at the people around me and take out whatever frustrations I have on the ones close to me. Phrases and words said to me that were meant to make me feel better would do everything but that. And I was too stubborn to realize that while I was hurting, I was unintentionally hurting the people around me with dismissive attitudes and testy actions. A question I've always had was, why me? It has taken me some time, but as I grow older and with every pain episode, I've come to realize that I'm more than my condition. I've accomplished quite a few things, 
and develop some traits and learn quite a lot because of this challenge life handed to me. The first, graduating high school and being accepted into university. That's something I never thought would happen. I survived my first year in university despite being set back due to hospital trips throughout the year. I've modeled for the first ever African Fashion Week here in Calgary, and I've done some collaboration photo shoots with photographers and designers I met at that event. As I mentioned earlier, if I get too tired, I could be thrown into a physical crisis. So because of that ability, I stayed far away from physical actions. The gym? No, thank you. And because of this, I found myself getting more and more interested in the arts. Related to that, one thing doctors would suggest whenever you are in some sort of physical discomfort would be distractions. That can come in the form of reading and writing, playing video games, or watching movies and TV shows. This heightened my interest in the performing arts, and I joined the drama club, the drama classes here in high school, and performed stage plays or helped with costumes and lighting. I won a karaoke competition at university, and I'm working on writing and publishing some books at the moment. I base my characters off different aspects of my life so far. In my current book, my main character's journey focuses from her growth from this weak, timid character to a strong-willed and motivated one. Advocating for myself in hospitals or in ambulances have taught me to be a little more expressive, and I developed a love for meeting and helping people. In one way or another, I like to think that because I know what it's like to feel hopeless and like no one could understand me, I developed a more empathic attitude. I become a more caring and understanding person that wants to make people feel seen and heard no matter what. As someone who doesn't get to choose when people see me at my weakest, I have developed a personality that allows people to drop their guards around me, but at their own pace. <sighs> at my lowest points, I would create stories in my head and scenarios that would allow me to be different characters than the one I am. This has me working towards my goal to become a drama teacher. I hope to create a space that allows students to be who they are or discover themselves. Sickle cell anemia is not a well-known disease. If I hadn't been born with it, chances are I would have no idea what it was or just how much it affects people. And because of this sad or true fact, I work my hardest to educate people on this disease as much as I can. My friends are able to confide in me and ask me questions about anything concerning sickle cell without the fear of, some, of saying something offensive. I have a story about my friend. He was in my drama class back in high school and he recently got casted to play at, um, at Storybook Theater here in Calgary. His character is a 13 year old boy with sickle cell anemia. And so he called me up to ask me about it. And I have to say, I was a little surprised because like I said, it's not a well-known disease. So there's not a lot of representation in the media. <sighs> I have so many goals and things I want to achieve, but how do I pick myself up and keep working towards these goals at times when I get so tired and helpless? There's a saying I love, people change people. I got that from a TV show. <laughs> um, the people that I meet throughout, my, throughout the last four years, actually throughout my life, are the reason I keep getting back up. I get back up for my parents who left their successful careers to move and start fresh in a new continent for a better lifestyle for their children. The same parents who named me Erica, which means warrior. So I never forget just how strong I really am. My mom back in Nigeria would carry me on her back up and down five flights of stairs whenever I was in pain. She has to watch me, she has to watch me suffer through these conditions and crises, but she works diligently to look for new ways of eliminating this disease for me. From my dad who always manages to put a smile on my face. You know what, I don't want him to. I get back up from my sister, who has my back when I'm in pain, and manages to keep a little sanity when I'm screaming my lungs out. My brother, who goes through the same thing that I go through, but less frequent. I wanna show him that while it's not always easy, he can bounce back up every time. I get back up from my friends, who have visited me in the hospital on multiple occasions, or listen to me when I need to rant or support me in various ways. They allow me to be just who I am and feel the darkest days with light. These are people I met either here in the mentorship program or in school. I get back up for Alyssa and Jose, my coordinators when I was in the mentorship program. I look back on those times and I remember all the fun that we had. And I remember that there is still fun waiting for me, so I have to get better. 
for all of you who I hope were inspired by all of this and can find some strength in my story that can see you through whatever battles you are going through. The smiles on people's faces, the laughs, the memories, the people in my life make every day worth it. They make the next step easier to take, no matter how hard I've been kicked down. They shine a light in my darkest hour and allow me to stumble or crawl my way towards that light. I think that's the hardest part of my journey so far, reaching for that light. What makes me, what makes us strong? Well, as human beings, it's not always easy, but we keep finding ways to get back up. We keep reaching, we keep working, we keep inspiring, we keep running, and we can rely on people to give us a push when we need it. Strength can be found in different places, whether we get our strength from within us or from the people around us, in movies, TV shows, guest speakers, coordinators, family, or friends. So, once again, I am a daughter, an older sister, a friend, a student, an aspiring writer, drama teacher, model, performer, and above all, I am a sickle cell anemia warrior. I am strong, I am resilient, I am Erica. Thank you all for listening. Erica, I think you have left us in awe and speechless and inspired. Um, thank you so much for your courage and sharing your story. You are, you, we already thought you were incredible, but man, this just, this just topped it. So thank you so, so much. And I definitely recommend you take some time to read through the chat because people are just praising you. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but um, thank you so much, Erica, for joining us. We are so, so grateful, and we've been lucky to have you with us today. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> wow, Bea, we have a model in the house. Can you even believe that? I know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was such a journey. It is. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing your journey with us all. As an alumni myself, I can totally relate and I am so proud of you for all the things that you achieved. Yeah. And just a friendly reminder, Bea, mm -hmm. for those youths right there that already received their swag bag but haven't checked it out yet, make sure to grab it right now as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> and check your swag bag because there's a Pizza 73 coupon in there. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Just what? One piece of 73 coupon in your yeah. swag bag. Yes. <laughs> and just in case <laughs> you haven't had already. You haven't received your swag bag yet. Don't worry. It will be given to you later this week. Yes. <laughs> All right. Another thing is maybe our youth is asking, how can we redeem those pizza? I'm definitely asking how <laughs> I can redeem that pizza. Hmm. I'm pretty sure you can redeem this pizza on any branches of pizza. Yes. As long as you redeem it right before December 21st, <laughs> which you should do. <laughs> December 21st, 2021. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And now for our next performance. Ooh. Brace yourself, everyone, for a very beautiful and heartfelt song from Phoebe De Lo Vergas. She is actually a mentorship student oh. in Father Lacombe High School. Look at me, homie. Yeah, look at Lacombe. <laughs> Let's give her a round of applause. Woo! See ya. 
Pagising sa umaga Sa bukang liwayway Paon ng pag-ibig Na aking taglay Unti-unting Bubuin Ang pag-ibig na nawalay sa akin Ingatan na ang puso ko Sa sakit na Bigay I need to get myself some vocal coach out here, or you can do it for me. All right. So, anyways, we now have our third, third door prize. Okay. And here we have our um, Dutch Blitz and Uno cards and everything like that. So, if you guys are interested in getting this prize, comment your name down on the chat box, and we will um, announce get back to you guys. Yeah, yeah announce, announce that really. pretty soon. Exactly. Yeah, but so, what do we have here, Gio? I think before we actually give the winner, let's talk about the of Super course, Mario Uno cards. Of course, he, he picked that up first. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is like the best Uno cards ever. Mm. If you really like Mario at the same time. Is that like, oh, okay. So it's Uno cards, but it's just like a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. And I think, Gio, we have our lucky winner. Oh, well, drum yes. roll, please. <laughs> Congratulations to Brenna Lee! Woo! Awesome, awesome. So again, Brenna, your youth worker will be in touch with you soon, right after uh, this program. Okay, so I am actually a little bit tired. Gio, are you feeling tired? I'm not tired, but I'm feeling uh, okay. thirsty, really thirsty. <laughs> I All right. need some water, right? So why don't we get a quick five-minute break? Yes, please. Yeah. So, Bea and every one of you watching us today, Make sure you grab some snacks. You know, any snacks that you have at home. <laughs> any snacks. And do some stretches. Yes. It's really hard watching a virtual uh, event like this because you're just staring at your laptop. Screen the whole right? day, yeah. Exactly. So make sure you do stretches like, you know, just flexing. It's doing like that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and then I'm pretty sure we all know that since the pandemic happened, it was really hard for, ever, for every one of us to actually find a job. Right. So... Yeah, so good thing is, we if you are looking for a job right now, there's a video from the Youth Employment Center. Woo! Woo! Hi everyone, my name is Violet Rudy and I work at the City of Calgary Youth Employment Center. I hope you're having a fantastic day at the Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth Youth Conference. I'm here today to tell you more about the Youth Employment Center services. 
As you can see, my contact information is up on the screen. Violet.rudy at calgary.ca is my email address. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and I'd be happy to help. The City of Calgary Youth Employment Centre provides free career and employment services to youth ages 15 to 24. So what that means is if you wanted to register with YEC, an employment counsellor will be assigned to you and they'll meet one-on-one -on -one with you. They'll complete an employability assessment by identifying your skills and abilities. They will get to know your interests, your values, and help you market your skills and experience to potential employers. Employment counsellors will also help youth target their cover letter or resume, offer job searching strategies, career planning assessments, offer industry training options. If youth are interested in volunteering, offer options in those. If youth have an interview coming up, we can offer mock interviews to help youth practice. We have many networking opportunities, things like informational interviews, job shadowing, and employer connections. And YEC works with many employers throughout the year, offering hiring events and employment opportunities to youth. Employment counselors will also assist youth to identify barriers to employment and provide appropriate referrals or support. All of YEC services are completely free for youth to continue to utilize these up until their 25th birthday. Currently, we are offering only remote employment services. This can be done online, through the phone, or through video conferencing. You, all you need to do is visit YEC's website, youthemploymentcenter.ca, and you can click here to book an appointment with an employment counselor. You'll be taking to our Sign Up Genius link, which will show you all the times and dates that we are offering employment sessions. YEC works with a variety of employers throughout the year. Currently, we are promoting employment opportunities in various industries, including housekeeping aids, food service, and cook assistants, cleaners, merchandisers, root sales representatives, hospitality opportunities in Jasper, caregivers for seniors, casual snow removal, registered respiratory therapist, voice captioners, security guards, dining attendants, warehouse opportunities, and more. For more information about any of these opportunities, feel free to connect with the Youth Employment Centre by visiting our website and scheduling an appointment, or you can follow us on social media platforms including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also on TikTok, and you can stay up to date with what's happening at YAC and all the current opportunities we have promoting. These are always changing. YEC facilitates workshops at schools, community agencies, and youth programs. Workshops include resume and cover letter writing, job searching strategies, interview preparation, a three-in-one employment workshop, which encompasses all of the previous workshops mentioned, just at a smaller scale, and our YEC services overview. When YEC does reopen, we will continue offering group tours to show youth around the center and provide services. You can also access our online workshop videos, which are shortened versions of our workshops, on our website, youthemploymentcenter.ca. As I mentioned earlier, the Youth Employment Centre is active on a variety of social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and the newly added TikTok. YEC promotes job opportunities, hiring events, shares information, employer partnerships, current programs, and offers employment tips for youth. Follow YEC today by searching Youth Employment Centre or YEC underscore Calgary. YEC does have two virtual employer spotlights coming up in February. The first is with Shopify on February the 10th at 2 p.m. and the second is with About Staffing on February the 23rd at 1 p.m. Both have the links in the description. Please make sure you register now as spots are limited. More of these will be displayed on our social media platforms and announced as they do come up. YEC will be hosting a live Q&A discussion around summer job search on February 19th at 1.30. Get your questions answered around summer employment and tune in live on Facebook, Instagram or on TikTok. If you miss this, that's okay. We will be recording it and posting it on our YouTube and Facebook channels. YEC also sends out the update newsletter monthly. This is one email a month and you can subscribe by visiting our website. The update newsletter includes current YEC information, recognizes YEC partnerships, provides information on upcoming hiring events and events going on at the Youth Employment Centre, employment opportunities, labour market trends, an article from our staff, and our monthly employer spotlight. Subscribe today so you don't miss out on our next monthly newsletter.
thank you for listening. My contact information is up on the screen once again. Feel free to take a picture of that and also follow us on all our social media platforms. Thank you very much and enjoy the event at the youth conference. Take care. Awesome. So I hope you all enjoyed your quick break. And I just want to remind everyone that we have many, many more prizes coming soon. <laughs> so sit tight and you might be our next lucky winner. But for now, it is time for our very first learning session with Leilani Rocha. Leilani is a climate and social activist from Ontario. Wow. And she is here with us today to teach us about the climate crisis in Canada and its relation to climate justice, something that I am actually really passionate about. So, let us please welcome Leilani. Hi everyone. I'll just share my screen in a second. So nice to meet all of you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the climate justice in Canada and the climate crisis. So I'll just do a little intro to myself. Um, as everyone said, I'm a climate and social justice activist and I'm from Ontario. So. I think that's a really good thing about this pandemic as we're able to connect in this way, um, even though I'm pretty far away from you. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm in my second year of university studying biomedical science at the University of Guelph. Um, I'm originally from India as well. My parents immigrated here from Bombay and Goa. I love to make art. And I'm also, I also got into activism about five years ago and I started public speaking professionally about two years ago. So just a couple questions, if we were able to, you can just put it in the chat. Um, I was just wondering where everyone else is from as well. And if you, um, like where you are from originally, uh, if you are new to Canada, if you were able to put it in the chat. Yeah, I was just curious. Eritrea, I see Nigeria, Philippines, India, perfect. That's so cool. Awesome. So. I think that's really great that this conference is here so we can learn a little bit about um, what is actually happening in Canada, especially during this whole climate crisis. So we'll do a little recap first. Thank you for um, participating. Um, so what is climate change? Climate change is the long-term increase in the average global temperature that is mainly being caused by humans. So. It is a really big issue in our lives right now, and it will affect us, the, this younger generation, a lot more, which is why it's so important to talk about. So climate change it has led to the extinction of lots of animals, natural disasters, extreme pollution, and so much more. So these are the things that you usually you know, get discussed in schools, you know, the earth's temperature is too high, it's affecting the animals. And all we can try and do is reduce the bad habits that we have, like electricity, transportation, gas and water and stuff like that. However, in recent times, what do you think has been all over the news? This virus, right? So it's, it's something that's really important. And it has been affecting all of us lately. So we have rarely heard about climate change um, in recent events, but did it disappear? No. <laughs> um, here's a really big fact. In 2020, the Earth's global temperature actually tied with 2016 as the warmest year on record, which is really crazy. And it tells us that climate change is still really affecting us lately. And it is worse than People are treating it in recent events. So, and especially that too, we didn't really hear a lot about it. So there's definitely a lot more to this story that we have not been hearing about. The way that we are taught about climate change is that our wasteful habits and everything that we are doing will have negative consequences on us, right? Like we're told that if we do certain things and have um, bad habits, it basically will affect us in that way. However, um, if you think about it, you'd think that that means that if we are super wasteful in Canada, we will get these natural disasters and mass extinction a lot, right? Our country has already been very wasteful, but how come we don't really see these extreme consequences yet? We see some, but they're not always very life-threatening ones. We see, we still have the ability to have a decent life with our 
basic necessities to survive most of the time. And so if Canada causes so many problems and climate change is supposed to be so life-threatening, where are these damages? Who takes the heat? So unfortunately, it is the areas that cause the least problems that do take most of the damages. So we'll go through some examples. So for instance, um, Mozambique in Eastern Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world, people are living on an average of about less than a cent a day. And they have a lot of lack of infrastructure and city planning. So they're clearly not a huge contributor to climate change and all of these issues, but um, they are definitely very affected by it. They have a lot of flooding and extreme weather that is causing the country to lose so much of their land and people are being forced to migrate because of the weather. So, and also all of Africa does not look like this, definitely, that's a good thing to note, but um, the continent itself does house almost all of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. So it's unfortunately said to be the most vulnerable to climate change. And then also, here's another example in Kiribati and uh, Tuvalu in the Pacific Islands. So Kiribati is one of the poorest countries in the world as well. And the island is already close to sea level. So the flooding as a result of climate change is causing the island to sink. Um, Tuvalu is also a very small island and is rapidly sinking as well. So it's predicted to be completely inhabitable in the next 50 years or so. In other words, the, the entire country will be completely underwater soon, which is insane to think about. So these are just some untold stories that show that the actual se severity of climate change is not really accurately shown all the time. And we don't really hear about a lot of these countries who are really struggling um, with the effects of climate change because here in Canada, um, it's not, it's not as, as big of an issue in all of our daily lives all of the time. So its impact can get lost within all these statistics and especially because um, you know, we're just told about this temperature and all of these other uh, facts and things like that. So sometimes it can be, it can appear very, you know, overdone and people will just brush it off as not as big of an issue as it really is. So there are lots of areas in Canada where we live that might not feel severely impacted by climate change. And we can sometimes forget about it when we are doing things like, for example, in this picture, eating ice cream. But there are so many areas in the world that are really, 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 really affected by climate change. So now it comes to the question, what can we do about it? Now that poses a question, what is climate justice? So this is a completely different thing going on and it is a new approach that um, we have started to adapt in trying to solve this climate crisis. Um, so what is climate justice? Here's a definition. Um, climate justice is a term used to phrase global warming as an ethical and political issue rather than one that is purely environmental or physical in nature. So what this means is it's basically shifting this whole idea. Usually people will, you know, tell us, oh, you know, what we can do is we can just turn our lives off more often or use less water, or stop driving as much. But this whole idea of climate change is so big and we need to make bigger changes in order to actually reverse its effects. So what this is doing, here are some major principles of it. Um, it basically tells us all individuals have a right to be protected from environmental harm because as you see, you know, there are a lot of places that are struggling with it and we need to take this a lot more serious, seriously. So climate justice takes action to fix these inequalities through decision making and laws and ensure protection. Um, climate justice also recognizes that discrimination occurs not only because of deliberate targeting, but is also a result of systemic issues. So. Uh, again, as you can see, in somewhere like uh, uh, in our country, we're able to um, do all of these things and, you know, really uh, have have a lot more than a lot of these countries do have. So it's, it just shows that there is a divide and someone someone is um, suffering at the result of our negative actions. And lastly, the most important, I think, is climate justice shifts the burden from the public and our us as consumers to the people who are the main contributors and the main polluters. So what this basically means is that climate justice shifts the responsibility um, from us as consumers to these bigger corporations. And 
these bigger corporations and systems and governments, they all have the ability to make changes and take immediate action compared to us as individual people. So instead of that, it's basically showing us that like changing our lifestyles as consumers, um, it is really good, but it's not the reasonable goal to uh, really fix climate change so fast. And because we have such an urgent need right now, um, us as consumers cannot carry this entire burden of climate change. Climate justice also discusses the discrimination and racism and why these specific areas or specific countries and areas inside countries are being affected more by climate change than others. So in order to truly solve climate change, we definitely need to have climate justice. So now that I've told you what climate justice is, let's talk about climate justice in Canada specifically. And I'll just give you some information about what's going on. And that's the main part of this talk um, to just show you, you know, these untold stories that we don't really hear in the news as often and people are really struggling in Canada. So the big picture is basically the same as I showed you about the whole world. Climate change disproportionately affects poorer communities that do the least, unfortunately. So this is a picture of an indigenous reserve in Canada. And the reason why I showed an indigenous com community is because indigenous peoples in Canada face the highest levels of poverty in this country. So around, and also around 50% of indigenous children in Canada live in poverty as well. So we will definitely talk a lot about indigenous peoples um, in this section of the talk. Um, so in general, high income families are definitely more responsible for greenhouse gases and emitting them into the air um, that lead to climate change in Canada. So, but then the, the sad thing is that they are able to live their life unaffected and continue to spend the most money compared to other communities. So if you think about it, if you compare people with, you know, a lot of money and people that don't have a lot of money, who is more likely to go shopping and buy lots of clothes, you know? Who is who is more likely to eat at restaurants every day, for example? Who is more likely to travel around the world frequently? It's going to be, you know, the people who have more money to spend. So, and unfortunately, these acts of spending money and doing these things do have really bad consequences. So for example, um, going to shop, uh, that is a big thing that we talk about lately, fast fashion. So um, clothes, the clothing industry is actually really, really, really bad for our environment. And um, unfortunately, you know, not a lot of people reuse the same clothes for many years, and they will just continue to keep buying new clothes and keep up with all the styles. So that definitely does affect our environment really badly. And then also traveling, for example, um, planes emit a lot of greenhouse gases into the air. So that's a really important thing that we need to reduce. And it just shows you that, you know, a lot of people that do have the most income are a lot of the big contributors to climate change. So at the same time, when we think about ways to reduce our waste, these things cost money too. So let's say, you know, we wanted to sorry. <laughs> um, let's say we wanted to reduce our greenhouse gases as a person. So things like solar panels and electric cars and things like that, they all require a lot of money. So unfortunately, you know, low income families cannot afford these more energy conserving options. And they are also more affected by these policies that we make in Canada, for example, to, um, for example, a carbon tax, uh, what, like raising the prices of things like uh, fossil fuels that release uh, CO2 into the air. So those things are a lot more expensive for these lower income communities to um, afford. And they will be the ones who can't really, um, you know, keep up with a lot of these changes. These things, don't get me wrong, like these things, the carbon tax is very good. It's very useful and definitely needed. But we do need to think about these people who cannot afford it. And, um, and when, when making these decisions to ensure that they are definitely a lot more supported, which is why we, you know, uh, talk about climate justice a lot. And we also have to ensure that these things are not the only things that are put into place. So the only changes that we are making in Canada cannot just be um, solely, you know, raising the prices of things because that definitely does affect a lot of people. So the key point of all that is 
wealthy people are more responsible for emissions than people in lower communities. Um, and they are they can better afford to work to fix it. Okay, so another part of climate justice in Canada, as I was saying, indigenous peoples are a very, very, very big part of climate justice in Canada. Canada is definitely very far from perfect when it comes to indigenous rights as well. And unfortunately that does also become a big part of our role in climate change in Canada. So the longer you live here, the more you will learn about the insane mistreatment towards indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, just a little brief history, Canada forced indigenous children into residential schools and tries to erase their culture not so long ago. And though they apologize, there are so many more issues that are still happening and still occurring. So this is not something that is in the past. So for example, right now, um, over 100 indigenous communities do not have clean water uh, right now. So that is something that is insane to imagine because you think that, you know, something like a basic necessity as having water is something that is a privilege in Canada, which is a first world country. It's kind of crazy that you know, like you never think that that would happen in a place like this, but 75% um, of indigenous water systems all across Canada are at high or medium risk of contamination, which is really crazy. So when it comes to climate change, it is no different. Unfortunately, Canada's government treats indigenous peoples with the same disregard. Um, Indigenous peoples are very respectful to the earth as well. So they're definitely, as an example, not the main contributors to destroying our planet. Um, but this is the state we are in. And it is also sad because indigenous peoples rely on natural land a lot more than the rest of us. And they would have preferred all of Canada to look like this, obviously. But, um, you know, the, the rest of Canada has definitely made it a lot worse than this. And going back to the disregard, when Canada is building things that harm the earth, typically the damage is given to indigenous people. So as you can see with the contamination of water and things like that, um, which is insanely messed up because they are the ones that originally um, had this land. So as you can see here, a lot of communities in Canada where indigenous people um, live are so polluted and full of contamination because of these bad decisions of big companies around them. And the government has definitely been making things worse. So here are some recent issues that are definitely really important to know about. Okay, so the What's What in Pipeline. Um, so this is basically this big pipeline in BC that, you know, as you can see here in this diagram, it goes over indigenous territory. So, oh, sorry. So a lot of people have been protesting this um, for a long time and, it, it was a very big part of our news about a year ago, especially. And it was a big, it was very controversial because a lot of people were um, arguing that this is needed and stuff like that. And they were also saying that a lot of indigenous peoples are okay with that. But the thing is um, in their culture, hereditary chiefs are the ones that are supposed to decide what is actually happening. And they're the ones who oppose it. But a lot of um, indigenous officials were agreeing with it anyway. So the problem with it is no one wanted this on their land and that's it. So a lot of people were protesting and it was really bad. There were a lot of blockades last year. A lot of people were getting arrested and injured and um, hurt by RCMP officers. So it was a really bad thing. But unfortunately, when COVID happened, it reduced a lot of the protests, obviously, because a lot of people were in lockdown. And this was definitely taken advantage of a lot. So as of this month, um, you can kind of see in this big picture over here, a third of the pipeline has already been laid, which is about 140 kilometers already. So that's kind of insane because, you know, uh, right under our noses, this was still happening and it, people were just not listening to the people who live here and did not want it on their land. So a big thing that happened last year is this thing called Bill 1 in Alberta, actually. So um, Bill 1 was passed in June of 2020. So it's not that long ago. And it specifically targeted indigenous protesters in Alberta who were protesting in solidarity with the, the with the pipelines as well. And it's still in effect. So these are screenshots from alberta.ca so you're able to look at this too. Um, so basically what, I'll just read a little bit of it. Um, the act legally defines 
essential infrastructure um, to include public and private infrastructure. So basically it was, um, this bill is allowing people to be um, arrested and fined, as you can see here, for um, residing and protesting on this essential infrastructure. So the, the way that they advertise it is, um, you know, they didn't, they were doing this out of the safety of people and they didn't want people to be around these areas um, while they were working on it because it was dangerous for people. But the problem with that is um, they define this essential infrastructure as so many different areas. So for example, yeah, the pipelines and oil and gas production sites, but they also said something, for example, the highways. And if you read the actual bill, they define highways as in a different act that um, actually said highways are roads, driveways, like even like anywhere, basically. So it, it was really insane because they're allowing people to be arrested um, anywhere if they um, if they wanted to. And it also allows rec regulations to expand the definition of essential infrastructure in the future. So if they wanted to deem other parts as essential infrastructure, they're able to. So it's pretty ridiculous. A lot of people were um, getting these fines and getting arrested for just protesting. So lately what's been happening is, um, yeah, in a recent interview with hereditary chiefs, they were basically saying, yeah, we still care about these rights, but unfortunately not as many people are protesting anymore because um, they are trying to focus their energy on caring for the elderly. And this is because in this pandemic, Indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And a lot of people are dying from COVID, which is um, very, very, very sad to say. So their message is they want, obviously they want more of a say in these big decisions, but they need to focus on um, caring for these people, especially um, in this pandemic. So the silence of indigenous voices definitely must end. And that's definitely what they want um, to change from now on. And now also something that is more recent as well, this giant mine monster. So this is um, the area, it's affecting Yellowknife Dene in, um, in the territory. So at this time, um, this, this is like a mine that used to produce, it produced a lot of gold and um, at a time, but it created a lot of contamination. So there's two, 237,000 tons of arsenic are still stored in this mine and it is harming the indigenous people that live there. So um, the Canadian government is planning on cleaning it up the mile, but they're not consulting any of the indigenous people there. So it's a very, very, very high risk. So if they, um, if anything goes wrong, their methods could literally kill everyone there, which is really, 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 really urgent. So there's a petition going around um, to call on the government of Canada to fix this issue and provide compensation for the indigenous peoples that live there. So you can um, just look up giant mine monster and you can find the petition and stuff if anyone's over 18 to sign it or you can ask your parents as well. Um, it's definitely something to check out. So, so yeah. And so that's just some examples of um, how these issues are affecting a lot of people um, in Canada and all of these contamination issues and things like that, that just shows environmental racism. And it just um, proves to us that Canada is definitely uh, not really consulting everyone. And there are a lot of issues that we need to um, really think about. So going back to this whole consumers versus big corporations and all of this, um, this is just a general thing of um, the world emissions in 2016. So this is just a breakdown of um, what in what in the world is really affecting um, these greenhouse gases and stuff like that. So if you really look at it, um, the majority of these issues are, you know, a lot of manufacturing and industrial um, processes and things like that. So it's not, it is a collective issue that, you know, all of our little actions are contributing to this, but a lot of these big contributor, contributors are these industrial processes and these factories and things like that, and also um, shipping, things like that. So it, it is, um, consumers don't really have the ability to reverse all of these things going on because all we can affect is our own impacts and we can't really affect you know how these how these um governments are choosing to get their energy or how these factories are um 
happening and things like that. So the key point of this is the responsibility to fix climate change has to lie in these bigger corporations right now. So now that we're getting there, um, let's just do a little activity. So this is basically just, um, we'll just brainstorm some ways. So let's say you're given a lot of money to make a change in Canada using all of this information that I've given you. I know it was a lot. Um, let's say you were given a lot of money and you are given the task of trying to work towards stopping climate change in Canada. What are some ways that we can try and solve this climate crisis? So what will your big idea be? What is one way that you can try and solve this? So think bigger. Um, what is a good change that you can make that would affect a lot of people in the country? Think about the problems that we have right now and what is something that would help a lot of people? What is something that would change something? What is something that other countries do that we don't maybe? What's something that hasn't been event invented yet, but you think would be really life-changing, things like that. Um, so we can just, you can get something to write, maybe a paper and pen, or you can just think about it in your head and just um, keep that idea in there. So we'll, we'll take about five minutes, I'll put some music on. And when you think about your idea at the end, we can all just put them in the chat and I'll read some, um, but yeah. So we'll get, I'll just try and put some music on in a second. And I'll put a timer on for five minutes.
Okay, we got about 30 seconds left, so just start typing your things in the chat and um, we'll call it in a second. So I'll just give you a, bit, a second just to put your things in the chat if anyone else um, wanted to say anything and then I'll read some. I'm loving these ideas. So some things that people are saying, um, more use of electric cars, um, making solar panels and electric cars and energy more cheaper and affordable for low income families. I like that one. Um, working with environmental organizations in different provinces as well as indigenous peoples to implement environmentally friendly procedures that would positively reduce the biggest environmental issues in communities. I like that one a lot. Mm. Awesome. using public transport more. Corporations of all kinds should team up to discuss how they make their products or services better to fight against the climate crisis. Awesome. Limiting carbon emissions, powering homes with renewable energy. Awesome. Regulating CO2 emissions from factories and people need to practice. Um, Awesome. Okay, cool. These are really great ideas. So um, I love that everyone is, you know, got their thinking caps on and are really thinking about, you know, what can we really do, especially, um, you know, as I was saying, as people, as individual people, there are things that we can do. There are, you know, ways that we can compost our food and stop using plastics and things like that. But again, at the end of the day, um, it is really good that we are making these changes, but um, for example, even if we stop using plastics, for example, when we go out to eat at restaurants, they're still gonna have, you know, these plastic things all the time. So it's like, we still have to think more and think bigger uh, when it comes to making these uh, bigger issues. Voting in people that have uh, the climate crisis as their priorities, awesome. Yeah, so these are amazing ways. and definitely just comes down to um we need people to care more about this climate crisis i like the one about um all of the corporations coming together and thinking about how they can change these things but the problem with that is um a lot of people are not having that in their interest they are prioritizing money and you know gaining gaining things and exploiting all of these lower income countries as well so we need to definitely try and stress that climate change is so crucial and so urgent right now um, for all of us, because it is something that will affect all of us uh, in the future generations, especially. And a majority of these older people in the government don't really think about um, the long-term effects of this because they're not gonna be around to bear the brunt of these damages and especially um, these other communities who are really suffering, we need to amplify that and really talk about it um, with people we know and with these corporations and really hold them accountable. So I really like that everyone is, um, you know, having such great ideas about that. Um, so now that we have thought about some ideas, let's talk about what Canada is actually doing. So um, most of these ideas they are starting to try to, um, you know, invest more in public transport and things like that and renewable energy. And But at the end of the day, we are still not doing so amazing because, again, we are not prioritizing um, the climate crisis in everything that we do. And again, like us as the younger generation really, really, really know um, how important it is to prioritize these things. But 
um, sometimes it's not really taken as seriously. So for example, um, Trudeau is still fighting for another Keystone pipeline. Um, so our priorities are definitely not in order and we need to really, really, really care about um, reducing our greenhouse gases as a country as a whole. Um, something also this year, he said he was going to ban single use plastic. So a lot of people were talking about reducing plastics. Um, but then again, where is it? Is, has it happened yet? Not really, things like that. So um, we really and we really need to spend money in these ways because all of these things cost money. In order to make things more affordable, it costs money. Um, so as a, as a whole, Canada really needs to up its game and really get serious about these things. So what can we really do um, to solve this crisis? Again, we need some more serious changes. So something recent, there's a petition going around to um, support Bill C-232. So this is to support the Climate Emergency Action Act. So you can read about it um, if you look it up on the internet. Um, so it, it basically just aims to, as it says here, recognize a safe, clean and healthy environment as a human right. So this talks a lot about climate justice and really um, ensuring that the government of Canada takes all of the measure, measures necessary to really um, combat this crisis. So I would also recommend going to sign this if you can. Um, and also more ways that we, we ourselves can help. Um, we can really get involved with trying to hold these places accountable. So this is a picture of uh, me about I'd say two years ago, um, protesting at Queens Park with my school. Um, yeah, so this was at with Fridays for oh, Fridays for Future, and um, they're in an organization that you can definitely get involved with. They have a lot of chapters, so there's one in Calgary as well. Um, and these organizations basically are really important to, um, you know, not only teach all of us about what's going on in Canada, but it also um, has a lot of um, petitions and actions and protests and things like that, that you can really um, hold these bigger governments and everything uh, accountable. So um, again, there are different chapters. So if you did want to get involved, let me know. Um, because all of these things that, all these ideas that you are talking about, how, how are people going to hear them? We need to get them to really listen to all um, the people who are really caring about this. So um, there's also Climate Justice Canada, which is also something that you can get involved with. Um, all of these groups are made up of youth um, like us. So they share a lot of information about um, climate activism across the country as well. So you can learn a lot about what else is happening um, in different provinces and things. And there are lots of frequent meetings that you can learn a lot about a di uh, different things. So you can have go to workshops and learn more about um, the climate crisis and also what we can do. It's not really a huge commitment to join. You can go to meetings whenever you'd like, and you can also help to plan events and also go to events and really help to make these direct changes. So if you did want to get involved in any of that, please let me know. Um, or you can um, just put it in the chat as well. Um, just ask any questions or anything. So yeah, I, I just put my um, info at the end as well. So if anyone wanted to contact me, but as a closing, let's just do a little recap. Um, when we discuss climate change, sometimes this actual severity of it is not really shown accurately. So as you can see, there are a lot of um, countries that are really struggling at the cause of this and really bearing all these damages. And even areas in Canada may not seem severely impacted sometimes. Like, as you can see, I'm sitting in my house right now and I'm able to live my life freely without really having climate change affect me um, and prevent me from having my basic necessities to live. But there are other areas in Canada that do not have that and are really affected by that. So it is really important to not um, have this climate crisis get lost with all these statistics and uh, appear very redundant. But because these marginalized groups are disproportionately affected and it is not widely known. So we definitely need to amplify that. And climate justice, again, shifts this responsibility from consumers to big corporations. So again, the lifestyles of all of us as consumers cannot be changed immediately. Maybe we can make a change, but not every single person in the world is going to immediately change 
all of their lifestyles drastically. So we cannot solely carry the burden of climate change. We need to really implement these bigger processes and these bigger systems have the abilities to make the changes and take immediate action. So therefore we must fix and fight climate change through this idea of climate justice. And in the end, whether our home and our environment seems fine right now, there are people around the world who are struggling and dying and need our help. And they are asking us, what about my environment? So that is all I have for you. Um, thank you for listening so much. You, you can have some questions right now. I have my contact info at the end um, if anyone would like. But yeah, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. And it was so nice speaking with all of you. And I'm so grateful for all of the ideas that everyone was saying. Thank you so much, Leilani. Um, I have learned a ton from you today. And it's really, really, I, like it's inspired all of us to, um, to take some action. And we're so grateful to you for everything that you're doing in your own life. Um, maybe I'll field the questions. Uh, so we've got about five minutes for questions. So the first one comes from Ray. What's the difference between global warming and climate change? Global warming. Okay. So climate change and global warming, they're kind of similar. So global warming just mainly talks about the actual um, temperature itself. And climate change also is more integrated, I guess. Like it, global warming really just refers to um, the actual warming of the earth mainly and climate change is really talking about um, how it is a long-term effect and stuff like that. They're kind of very similar, honestly, but um, when we're talking about climate change necessarily, like we can talk about both, but climate change really encompasses everything that we are talking about, like all of these negative effects and stuff like that. So um, that's why I like to use the word climate change, especially because, you know, it, it has the word change. So it shows us that like, the world is not the same anymore and it is really um a big issue as well i see someone saying they want to join as well so um where can i join these movements so um if you look up um you can go on instagram or go on um anything basically and if you just look up fridays for future calgary for example or climate justice canada you can definitely message someone through that or you can also contact me and i can get you involved most of these organizations they can um they work and do most of our communication through slack i don't know if anyone has heard about that but um so that's definitely where you would join the forum and everyone speaks about all of the meetings and everything through there so that's definitely um where you would be able to get all of that how would you explain what the carbon tax is? Okay, so the carbon tax, basically, it's just um, making the price of fossil fuels and everything um, more expensive, basically. So it's, it's basically just trying to um, get us as Canadians to reduce um, our consumption, because obviously, if you make something a lot more expensive, people are more le less likely to pay for it and like consume a lot more of that. So that's basically... Um, what it is but as i was saying especially um it does um really affect the low income communities a lot because they can't really afford to do that kind of stuff so that's why it's important that this carbon tax yeah it is good because it does reduce a lot um of the people who do you know use a lot of gas and things like that to reduce their consumption but it can't be the only thing that we are doing because it is a you know negatively affecting the people who really need uh that and can't really afford to um, you know, bear the brunt of those really high charges. Um, Slack is great. <laughs> um, what would you say to young people who are frustrated by the lack of action of those in power? Okay, I'll just end with that. Maybe um, that is definitely a big part of all of this. And there are a lot of, you know, a lot of pe young people are really struggling with dealing with this. Um, it, as a young person, it is really, really, really frustrating to feel unheard by all of these, um, you know, the government officials and other people who are just really not listening. So what I would say is just know that surround yourself by other young people who are feeling the same way. And I would say that just having some hope sometimes, and 
really looking towards, you know, what, what good has come out of this. Um, oh, sorry. I will put my contact information. Looking, looking towards the good parts of this. So what has, what has come out of this? What, what good parts about it um, are, are we able to think about? So like, for example, you know, a lot of us are really implementing a lot of different things. So it's like the fact that Canada is making a little bit of effort or every time that, um, you know, something good happens, it's really important to celebrate that and just remember um, all of the good things that are happening. And then that too, surrounding ourselves with other people who really care about this and are also very frustrated too, really helps because that gives us a lot of hope for the future um, if we all band together, especially. Um, I'll just see if there's any other information. Mm -mm. Oh, thank you for Nicole, um, for talking about global warming and climate change as well. Um, I don't think there's anything. Thanks to be oh. all the questions, Leilani. Thank you so much okay, awesome. <laughs> for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and empowering us to make a change. Thank you for being the leader that you are. We're really, really grateful that you've spoken to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Leilani. That was so very insightful and of course really eye-opening, especially for our youths, right, Bea? Yes, oh my gosh. I especially love the fact that we do have to really take it seriously now, especially during this time. Yeah, especially climate change is actually happening. Yes. So I hope everyone of you really listened and got inspired to be a positive change maker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we hope you're still there because we are so ready to give another door prizes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next door prize will be showcased again by our, by my partner, <laughs> Bea. Yes, okay, so right here we have this art kit. Okay, let me just open it and give you guys a sneak peek of wow. what it will be. Okay, we have an art kit. We have some colored pencils, as well as a pen, and also a journal. And let us not forget, when you want a break, get a Kit Kat. Yes! yes. <laughs> so again, please everyone, comment your full name, okay, your first and last name on the chat box, and to receive this prize. And Gio, are we ready? I think we already have winners for this awesome wow. prize. So congratulations to Shams Muhi. Woo! So remember Shams that just make sure wait for your youth worker to get in touch for with you for your prices yes and i think we have another winner for us <gasps> we do yeah we are just so generous two winners <laughs> wow all right everyone all right the next winner for this awesome kit goes to caitlin gibbons yes wow congratulations congratulations, congratulations caitlin and always just a friendly reminder yes. that make sure you just wait for your youth worker to keep in touch regarding of your prices. Yes, yes. So again, <laughs> congratulations to those two winners. Like as Gio said many, many times, wait for your youth worker to get in contact mm -hmm. with you. All right. So now are we ready to get back to our performances? Gio? I am so ready. Are you so ready, everyone? I right hope you there. guys are all ready. Woo! All right. So now we have a multicultural back-to-back -back performance from one Henok, a father Lacom student yes. who is going to be doing an Afro dance. And our second performance, our students from Centennial High School, Casey and Miel, with their own rendition of the original Filipino song called Your Song. So let's give it up for them, everyone. <laughs> Gamoy gitako, dorse taro, tanes gadis shime dasaru. So what? Endos, otos, kamos tanara. Aske, so omori, misimera, tara mano wa chara. Tara mano wa chapo ishe de basama. Di chande zadre ga kita soda sama. Ya no dere to pia po ishe de basama.
Really with the bitches, every bitch trip Loading up the clip, never slip tight, never sleep Finna let it rip, in this bitch tight
I love that these performances were back to back. Yes. You know, from a cool Afro dance that made us go up and dance ourselves, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> yeah, to a very mellow love song, the Gallup Filipino love song, that really made us feel love at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> I'm just going to say that this is truly a celebration of different cultures and, of course, amazing talents yes of course <laughs> and i especially love the fact that there was like such big energy in the beginning mm -hmm. and then we go down again and it was so mellow and relaxing right i know oh my gosh <laughs> Wait. Want more Gio. more more all right <laughs> coming up next everybody <laughs> here is a short video from another cbfy program <gasps> called the after school oh. program so let's take a watch everyone yes let's do the Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth presents the After School Program. A group of programs for immigrant, refugee, second generation, indigenous, and low income children and youth in Calgary. Bridge Club is for grades one to six. It's a program where children and youth engage in activities, arts and crafts, games, discussions, and STEM projects. Next Gen Junior High for grades 7 to 9 is a program where youth engage in activities, lessons, events, prizes, field trips, work on developing leadership skills, and preparing for high school. And there's Next Gen Homework Club for grades 10 to 12. This is a tutoring program where youth can get personalized tutoring in every core subject three days a week. All of the programs are currently taking place online using Google Meets. But that doesn't stop them from providing fun, interactive, and educational activities. Join one of these programs to attend field trips, parties, workshops, and get awesome swag. Last year, our programs went to Harvest Lights, Telespark, Bricks for Kids, and Horseback Riding. This year, our programs offered free workshops on photography, video game creation, arts and crafts, STEM, and more. Youth could also attend movie and game nights and Instagram live cooking tutorials. Our programs also run in the summer. Last year, participants from grades 6 to 12 got to take part in four weeks of an at-home escape room. We also ran a summer park program for grades 1 to 9 where we played outdoor games and activities. But don't just take our word for it. Let's hear from some of the youth who have been part of the after-school program. Dear Bridge Club, I want to mention how much fun I've been having. I really appreciate how much effort they put into their work for the Bridge Club students like me to have fun. They also encourage us to set goals and work towards them. My favorite part of Bridge Club was decorated cookies. I am sending this email because I want all the facilitators to know that I appreciate them and you. Also, I would like to thank you guys for this amazing experience and with it I made a lot of friends. And the club has helped me connect with different people from different backgrounds. It's helped me look at things from other people's perspectives. It also helped me with learning and stuff because they have a variety of tutors who are pretty cool. The after school programs are a place to meet new people, build new friendships, and expand social and life skills. Our programs support children and youth to develop their confidence, resiliency, and leadership skills in fun interactive and educational ways. Participants will build a sense of responsibility as well as critical and practical skills which will empower them to succeed. Our programs are places to feel a sense of belonging, comfort and support. If you would like to join one of the after school programs you can email Bridge Club at bridgeclub at cbfy.ca or follow Next Gen Junior High on Instagram at NextGenYYC and follow Next Gen Homework Club at NextGenHWC. You can also contact the After School Program for general inquiries through afterschool at cbfy.ca. For more information about the After School Program and the Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth, you can find us at cbfy.ca. 
All right. Thank you, ASP, for that awesome video. Next up, we have Jackson Say to lead our second learning session. Okay, so Jackson is an interdisciplinary artist wow. and facilitator that is originally from Hong Kong. He creates works in film, dance, poetry, theater, and the healing arts. Oh. And also, Jackson is a graduate of Queen's University. Mm. And another fun fact about Jackson, he actually used to work with the after-school program. Wow. Yes, so today he will be sharing his award-winning documentary with us as well as his personal story. So let us please welcome Jackson Say. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh, my gosh. Wow. What a welcome. Uh, MCs, you're doing such a great job. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it, it, you know, just watching those performances takes me back to when I was working. Uh, hello, everyone. So many wonderful chat messages. Um, uh, yeah, it just takes me back to the Power of Voice conference way back when I was working at CBFY and the sheer amount of talent that you all have. Like, I was just, I like, a part of me was like, should I go? Like, I don't, I don't need to be here, you know? Like, <laughs> you all should just be performing and that should be the day. I think that's enough. It's like so incredible. You have so much talent here. Um, and I'm so honored to be invited to, to share a little bit of my story. And um, I, I miss all of you too. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to, be in such good company and um and and like yeah see some and, and feel like the warmth and the love from over the distance <clears throat> i'm calling today from a sunny vancouver also known as the unceded territories uh of the coast salish peoples which include the musqueam squamish and the and the uh Mus musqueam squamish and the Tsleil tooth first nations um, and it's a really big privilege to be relying and residing on these lands today. Um, I wanted to start by offering a, a, a small video um, that I've made, a first film, a little bit of an introduction about what it is, um, let you see it and then talk about it a little bit more. Um, I caught the end of Leilani's beautiful presentation and this one is a little bit, it's less kind of a, I guess, a traditional presentation style. Like I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. It's more me sharing stories and, um, and I'll be tracking the chat a little bit um, if people have questions at any point, but I really want this to be kind of an interactive and engaging conversation because I'll be sharing a personal story, the piece that I'll be sharing as well as my first film, it's a documentary, which is also quite personal. And so if it's connecting with you in any way, if there are parts that jump out or resonate with you, feel free to let us know in the chat. And if you have any questions or anything as well, please feel free. Um, just a little intro, in 2018, um, there were three nonprofits here in Vancouver where I live. I love intersections, real youth, and out in schools that convened for a creative matchmaking project. And uh, they matched queer emerging filmmakers with established troublemakers. So like seniors who had shook things up and really made some change in their day, uh, really activated their voices. Um, <clears throat> and and paired us up and then we spent a weekend just uh, I, I was paired up with the like the legendary Paul Wong. I didn't know who he was before I met him, to be totally honest. Um, but when I met him, he just had like such a commanding presence that I felt like this has got to be a celebrity. And so I like Googled his name and I learned that there's like interview after interview after interview. He's got a whole like Wikipedia page. And I was like, oh, my gosh, who am I to like follow this guy around, but he was really down to earth. And um, I had the opportunity to ask him some personal questions. He's also openly gay and artist and also of um, Chinese descent, like just like me. And I never really had anybody like that growing up, you know? Um, I felt pretty lonely. 
uh, without any sort of role model like that. And so this is um, the efforts of the, the, the week of uh, filming and uh, it's premiered at the Vancouver Queer Film Festival, Vancouver Short Film Festival, won an award in Berlin and, um, and is continuing to be distributed this year. So uh, please enjoy, I think Kathy, you might be able to show us. And if not, I can always also send the link to folks if that's needed. We've all operated out of fear. Fear of the others and fear of ourselves. What would it be like to have no fear? You know, I grew up with people doing this. Chinky, chinky Chinaman. <laughs> Walking down the street, someone would just do this. Sitting on a bus, people would turn around and do this. People would do it overtly or sneakily. You know, so other people didn't, didn't, didn't see it. And that used to be very upsetting. Through this one gesture, they were able to racialize you, bully you, offend you, have power over you. My name is Paul Wall. I'm a child of the 50s. I'm 63. <laughs> Off <-key. laughs> You know, I come from a history, um, a, f a family history, a class history, a racial history that was based on colonial exploitation and rejection, where you were not allowed. You weren't allowed. You know, uh, we came to this country as indentured workers. The most dangerous jobs that nobody else wanted at the lowest wages and treated with inequality and all that goes with that. So we're willing to put up with that. I was almost born genetically with rejection that I didn't really belong here and that I should expect less because that's what the immigration policies specifically in this place expected of us. Growing up with parents who had gone through all of that, who were willing to put up with all of that and who wanted the best for us and of course wanted us to be safe. So we were expected to be silent. We were expected to be model citizens. We were pushed to be most mainstream as possible, to assimilate and be doctors, lawyers, and good accountants, not to be radical artists, certainly not to be out loud, proud, and, and queer. You know, with the silence already going on within mainstream dominant culture values, you know, the segregated Chinese and isolated Chinatowns, you know, there was no room for dissent. It was just be, be quiet. So my role as an artist has really been to break that silence. It's so important to be visible, to come out of repression and silence. What does that mean? And it means claiming a space, claiming a space, for, and in my specific smaller role, a creative space, myself and others, to express oneself with as much freedom as possible. You know, I've tasted moments of creative freedom, just little moments, and they have been like, wow. And I have provided and seen others given that bit of creative freedom and what they can do. So play.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Whew. Yeah, I always feel like I need to take a breath after watching a piece like that. Um, I guess, um, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I, I guess I'm curious if there was something that, that um, stood out for you, if there was any part that resonated with you. Um, for, for me, yeah, like I followed him around for two days and compiled like hours and hours of footage into like this small five minute piece. And so yeah, I'd be curious to, and so these are the parts that really like stuck out for me throughout those two days. And so I'm curious about like within those five minutes, like what really stood out for you? So I'm seeing Brel speak to having to be quiet in fear of being rejected. Yeah, yeah, I, um, that's really real. I think, you know, growing up, uh, yeah, I just, I didn't like English definitely wasn't my first language and I was teased and bullied because I wasn't like a stereotypical like boy, boy. Like I, like I saw the kids on the playground playing like, I don't know, their games, the boys playing their games, but I was over here like making dandelion crowns on the side of the field. And like, I just didn't like the things that typically boys like to do. And so I felt like, yeah, I definitely was um, hurt a lot and felt like I needed to quiet my voice in order to stay safe and, and be safe. And that was something, you know, I recognized that my parents wanted for me too. And Paul speaks to that, right? Like he speaks to kind of a desire for um, the parents for us to be safe because inherently they felt discriminated against as well. And so they, they wanted us to, yeah, to keep our head low and get a good job and lots of, um, yeah. And so that, that, that's really resonant for me. Yeah, lots of Asian oppression for sure. Lots of anti-Asian oppression. Vancouver especially has um, anti-Asian oppression has um, increased 878% compared to 2019. Um, yeah, absolutely. I can send, um, there's some requests to get the video and I'll send it in the chat later because I think, yeah, there were some moments where it was laggy and I, I would love to share that link with everybody. There's a public link on YouTube that I can send it to folks. Um, yeah, expect it to conform. Mm hmm Yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. I think I'll move now into the part where I share my story. Um, and uh, yeah, and then see how that relates to you. If there's any parts that again, resonate with you. Um, and if there are any questions at any points, I'm gonna to try to leave about 10, 10 minutes for questions. Cause I, yeah, I just really wanna connect with you all. And I think you're great. So um, yeah, feel free to continue sharing those thoughts with everybody as I, as I launch in. Um, I think that something that's important to me as I'm like negotiating my relationship to land is um, understanding my own ancestry a lot more and defining my role um, and relationship to my ancestry. Um, yeah, I, I'm just finding that's like, really important for me in my process right now. So I'll share with you that I, uh, like my, my, on my mom's side, she's Chiu Chu from Guangzhou region of China. And my dad's from Shanghai, um, the Yangzhou region of China. And um, they were refugees of the cultural revolution. And they actually met in um, like low income refugee housing in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, my dad grew his business and eventually, you know, married my mom and then had me. And I moved to Calgary when I was really young or Treaty 7 territory. Um, and I, yeah, kind of growing up, I knew that I was different, like I said earlier, but I didn't really exactly know why. Um, 
and my English wasn't very strong. Um, and my parents, you know, sacrificed a lot to come here. Their entire family was back there, you know, calling long distance back in the 90s was like a dollar a minute. And, you know, it was just so, so different. And it was for the promise of like a better education and a better future, which is such a common story for all of us as immigrants and refugees and people who, whose ancestors come from different places, diasporic places. Um, and so I felt, you know, maybe even as a young person, like I knew I loved the piano, I loved dancing, I loved singing and acting and all of these things, but I put that aside as like the thing that I would do on the side. Um, and I would study on my math and my times tables and my sciences. And my mom would like, you know, we didn't have access to a photocopier or a printer back then. So she would like hand write mad minutes for me um, on like loose leaf paper. And I would just do them to practice and get better. Um, and yeah, there's just so much around like making food and making sure that I'm fed well and nutritiously so that I could study hard. And so I felt like, yeah, I just felt like I was really supported by my parents. And also I felt some expectation on my own part, some pressure that I put on myself to do well at school. And I knew we were low income. And so um, I knew I needed to like try to work hard, get good grades, also get involved with student government and volunteer and stuff like that in order to get to to a good university and get scholarships and stuff like that. And so I did, I worked really hard and in high school I was student council president and I got some scholarships and I got to Queens. Um, I was also like really heavily involved with my church, which is something that was really important to me and Queens had a really strong Chinese Christian fellowship. Um, and, and then, okay, so then I went to Queens and and I decided to study engineering because it seemed like, you know, all my teachers were really recommending it being from Calgary, like oil and gas was like such a big field and engineering is a good degree to have. I was good at the maths and the sciences. Um, and I, I fe felt like that was, uh, yeah, it was just felt like a good degree to have. I'm also seeing some hands, which is great, uh, but I'll, I'll take questions at the end if that's okay. Um, and then, so I just, I went to Queens and I did the engineering degree and suddenly I wasn't like the top student anymore. I was like surrounded by people who were like great from all corners of the country. And they were actually like into engineering because they liked it. And, uh, I didn't have my mom <laughs> to, and being a man, like I, definitely uh, was spoiled and had the privilege of her cooking and cleaning. Like I didn't have to learn how to do any of that. So I didn't really know how to do that. And I didn't really know how to like take care of my mental or physical health. I was studying something that I didn't like. I was starting more and more to question my sexuality and coming to terms with like the rigid restrictions of um, like the evangelical Christian faith. And I became really depressed um, and I uh, stopped, you know, I, I like lost my scholarship. I um, was sleeping like uh, way, I was like skipping class and sleeping and then like just kind of numbing myself by like w watching lots and lots of TV. I was just kind of in this like really like terrible, I was depressed, you know, classic symptoms of depressed, although I didn't really know it at the time. Um, and I was really ashamed and I, and there was no longer this golden boy. I was like getting nineties before and I was getting like fifties and sixties. And I was like, what am I going to do with my life? And really scared. And I didn't really know what was going to do, what was going to happen. And I felt like that was like my rock bottom. And the only light at the end of the tunnel was like this opportunity that I'd gotten. I applied to go on exchange to the university, national university of Singapore. And I was like imagining myself late at night, like I was like sleeping, going to bed, like dreaming of swaying palm trees and delicious food and sunlight. Um, and like really just like excited to get out of there. And that was like my way out. And so I decided to leave. Um, and so I, so I made it I, and then I like flew over to Singapore and um, I committed to myself that this, this was an opportunity for me to just like try something new and be, to reinvent myself. 
So I was, I stopped, like I stopped praying before eating, which was something that I would never do. I like started swearing. Um, I also started um, hanging out with people that I normally wouldn't hang out with. Like uh, there was a friend that I made named Liz, who was a staunch atheist who would um, go dance in the rain every time it like tropical rain in Singapore, she would go out and just like dance in it. And I just looked at her like she was crazy. Uh, and she would like go take, like whenever there was a spider in her room, like I growing up in maybe like an Asian household would just take my slipper and like kill it. But she would take a glass cup and a piece of paper and like gently talk to the spider and like capture it and then take it outside. and like all the way down the stairs of our dorm and like give it to, give it to um, the nature. And I just felt like, wow, this is somebody who is, is so different and so wonderful. And also recognizing that like, if my faith told me that she's going to hell, like I just can't really imagine what that's like um, to be there. And eventually, you know, we grew close and, um, and I felt safe around her and she became the first person that I came out to. Um, and she was really great about it. And I also, at that point, I, you know, recognized the relationship that I had with my family, with my parents. Um, and they, it was a really important relationship and I wanted to maintain it and I wanted to be honest with them. And I felt like I had a choice. I had to choose between either um, potentially losing my family uh, losing my whole Christian community, which was like essentially my, all my friends back home. I, I could potentially lose all of that, or I could live a life that was authentic and honest with myself. And, um, and I'm not saying that this is like the, what I did was the right thing or that everybody has to do. It. And I think it's more complicated than that too. But at the time I really felt like I had this choice and I chose to be honest with myself. And so um, I told my parents and that was really hard. Um, they, didn't, they didn't have the response that I wanted. Uh, they, were, they wanted to fix me, uh, send me to a Christian psychologist. I, we didn't really speak for years, but I believed somehow in my heart that like the love that they had for me was going to sustain us through as a family, that all the love that they'd shown writing out those times tables and my mom getting up early in the morning to make food for me, all the sacrifices that they'd done. I believed that that love would sustain me in um, ensuring that in the future, it would be okay. And that was the leap of faith that I took. Um, and it was hard for like seven years. And in the last, in the last three, it's been a lot better. And now, you know, we celebrated Lunar New Year, like distance together. And it's, um, we're having regular calls and WhatsApping each other. And it's been a long journey, but um, it's okay. Like, I believe that love changes things and it did. And so that also was like this critical moment because it helped me realize that like I needed to do things not what I, I thought was right for me, but what my heart needed. And it be like any sort of exercise or building of a muscle, like the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And so, and so I decided to continue doing that. You know, I decided to, um, after going home, uh, after the exchange, well, during the exchange, I like traveled as much as I could, thankfully. Um, I had, yeah, the resources too, and everything was really, really cheap. Like there was zero dollar flights from Singapore to Malaysia. And, um, and so I just traveled as much as I could and like got to experience um, going and pursuing things that I wanted to just be just for the sheer delight of doing that. And then going back to, to Calgary or going back to Queens, 
Um, I came out to my friends as well. Not all of them were accepting, but I, uh, I stayed true to who I was. I always loved doing musicals, but I tried out for a musical in first year and was rejected, didn't even get a call back and I was devastated. Um, so I was like, no, this is not for me. But then, uh, but then I think I like realized I really missed it. And so in fourth year, I went back and I auditioned and they, I got in and then I ended up starring in a second musical in my second semester. And then I knew I didn't want to do engineering. I had already done an internship in, in a previous year. And, and so I was like, I, I kind of want to keep traveling. And at the time there were companies that you, all you needed was a bachelor's degree and then you could go teach overseas um, and they would pay for your flights and pay for accommodation and everything. And so I decided to go to the country of Georgia, where I taught English overseas and I learned English or I learned their cultural dance and I learned Georgian and I lived with a family on the side of the Black Sea. And then I did that for another year. This time I thought, OK, I, I love the heat and I love the water. I'd love to work in the Caribbean. And there was a place that was hiring called Guadeloupe, this little butterfly butterfly shaped island that was a French colony. I went there and I learned about the history of slavery and I learned about in inequity. I learned the dance and cultural heritage there. Um, and then I was like yearning to come back to, to Calgary and like access some queer resources because I really hadn't explored that part of my life yet. And I came back and I got a job at CBFY um, and uh, I started the Next Gen Homework Club. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it's grown and continued after all these years. I worked at Father Lacombe and that was really and, and some other schools as well. So. It's just so nice to be welcomed back and to, to see like the connections are still there. Um, and all the while I continued following my heart, you know, strengthening that muscle of like, what did this, what is, what am I curious about? Like, what is mysterious to me? What excites me? What thrills me? And like, you know, what I wanted to learn about massage. So I took some massage courses. I wanted to learn about Reiki. So I did that. I like wanted to go hang gliding. So I took some hang gliding courses and yeah, gratefully, you know, I was, I was like living at home and I paid off my student loans and I used like extra money to, to do these things. And, and so I just ended up like doing things that I, I continued strengthening that muscle of like following your heart, following your heart. Meanwhile, Liz had moved to Vancouver and um, on my vacation time, I would go visit them. And I started following, falling in love with the ocean and the landscapes and the cherry blossoms and Liz even more. And, and, and so in 2017, I decided to move here and have continued to like um, follow my heart, you know, and continue to just, um, yeah, it's it, the journey continues um, like uh, different opportunities. It's funny once you start like showing who you are, as Paul says in that video, like being visible and taking up space and and um, being clear with the world, what you are like things start coming through to you. You know, I was walking around the lake one time in Vancouver, just in a park. And this person comes up to me and like saw I was in like a mech jacket and like asked me if you, I like the outdoors. And I was like, yeah, I like the outdoors. I'm not like a huge rock climbing downhill skiing person, but I, I like like hanging out by the water and <laughs> going to hug trees. But uh, I um, and they're like, great. There's like this all expenses paid retreat that I would love for you to go to. It's like for leadership leaders in the outdoors and it'd be great for you to go. Um, I work for Mac. Here's my card. You can check me out in the website it's just so you know that it's not crazy. But yeah, you can just go. You don't even need to apply and you can go. And so I was like, OK, so I like signed up. I, I went, um, packed my bags and went. And then turns out at the retreat, they were looking for their next ambassador. And like, I didn't even know that at the time. Uh, and <laughs> and then I I just started talking about like, what nature has done for me. So since leaving the church, I've always been a spiritual person and have felt connected to nature. Um, instead, of, I've since learned that religion for me is just a little different, you know, it's different languages to access something greater than myself, you know, like the divine. And I believe that there is something bigger that connects us all. But, uh, 
But I, for me now, like nature is one of those things where I feel all at once really small and insignificant, but also deeply connected to everything around me. And so I spoke to that and the importance of, you know, reclaiming who I am away from these colonized ideas, these ideas that have been implanted in me, that being queer is wrong, that being like a person of color is like less than, that like just these colonized ideas, I wanted to reclaim those um, and wanted to share that with other queer, trans, black, indigenous people of color. And they really liked that. And they chose me to be their next Mech ambassador. And I was like, totally baffled. Um, but then that gave me like a lot of visibility. And I was like featured on their website. I did like an ad, like, and, and, and then like things just started spiraling, you know? Like I recently uh, performed um, in a musical, uh, but like paid professional theater rates and, this this film has gotten quite a lot of notoriety and and um, and recently I was uh, I had applied to and received um, a coveted position as a production trainee on Ryan Reynolds um, group effort initiative uh, and yeah he selected ten BIPOC um, to be like out of sixty thousand applicants to be part of his most recent like Netflix project in Vancouver and I was one of the 10 that was selected and in the end you know it didn't it wasn't the greatest experience I did feel some tokenization and and um and I don't have to get super into that right now um but like it was still just like a really cool learning experience and I never would have thought that that would have happened to me so I think yeah, um, but but again, it's like that practice of like following your heart, following what's true to you. And so maybe those those are the questions that I would offer you. You know, you're all like so ta so talented, and the world is here for you to take. And I think it's really exciting that industry, as as I see it, there's more and more opportunity for people who have traditionally been marginalized and historically oppressed. You know, your voices and your stories are being sought now, um, specifically. And so how do you, yeah, what, what draws you? What's interesting and exciting for you? Like those are questions um, for you to answer on your own. And, and Paul continues to be an elder and a mentor in my life. And you know, this is put together by the mentorship program. So like, who are the mentors in your life? Who are the elders in your life that, you know, really support you? Um, and can you give thanks to them for paving the way for you? You know, I think that last scene, uh, there's lots of interpretations of that, what that last scene entailed of me and Paul, like looking at the camera. But for me, there was like a recognition of, all he'd gone through, you know, the, the eye pulling, like there was stuff that I got to, but he must have gotten that so much more being somebody who grew up in the sixties, you know, and seventies and, and like the, the work that he's done to make it better for us. Like who are those people that you can, yeah, that, that like have paved the way for you. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, I, I want, I said, I wanted to offer some um, time for questions if people have questions, but um, I, yeah, I, I, I wanted to, yeah, share that. That's my story. Um, and it continues to be like an ongoing path. Honestly, I, after the Ryan Reynolds thing, I was pretty disillusioned with the film industry. And now I'm like, I don't really know what I'm going to do. So like I, I'm, yeah, I, I love facilitating and I love speaking and education and I love young people and I love like equity is really important to me. And so are the arts. And now I'm going to take a course um, starting on Monday, like with creative recovery. And I'm going to be learning more about like what it means. To, I'm going to do like daily writing exercises and creative assignments and just like, learn more about myself and where I want to go and what I want to do and what continues to intrigue me. So it's like this continuous process, you know? And so I encourage you to do that too, you know, follow, follow your heart and be true to who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Vancouver right now. 
I got a direct message about that. What's my favorite color? My favorite color is yellow <laughs> and gold. Yeah, gold and yellow. <laughs> oh, where do I see myself 10 years later? That's such a good question. Uh, I mean, if anything, the pandemic has taught me to like not look too far into the future or plan too far into the future. But 10 years later, I'm gonna be like 40. Um, I really would love to bring my, my family here, my brother and my parents to Vancouver. They, my parents are getting to the age of retirement and like Calgary's getting pretty cold. Um, so that's kind of like a lofty dream that I'd love. Um, I'd love to continue working with young people and facilitating workshops and speaking and like mentoring. And I'd probably want to have like my own, yeah, continue to be following my heart and doing things that excite me creatively, whether, yeah. And I call myself an interdisciplinary artist because there's just so many things that excite me. And I think they're all kind of connected and, and can jive with each other. So, oh my goodness, lots of questions. Um, what is tokenism? Oh, that's such a great question. Okay, favorite food first, favorite food. Oh my gosh, I love Chinese food. Um, my parents make the best food. Tokenism is a great question. Um, for me, tokenism, is um, is when you're being, how do I say? So right now, as I said earlier in industry, there's a real push for people to, like people of color for especially to speak about their experiences and like help to change that, change the world and like make, changes happen but when you're kind of upheld as like that one person to be able to do that that's a lot of pressure and it's also unfair because you're not recognizing like the the systems that you've got um, and the prejudices that you've got internally that contribute to the system and so I think tokenism for me is when somebody like you're kind of being pushed forward as like this one thing that's like this shining light and expected to do all this change, but there isn't actually like the internal processes that are, and the infrastructure to support that person. And also the internal exploration and investigation of changing what that is. Um, yeah, great question. Thank you, MCs. And if other people wanted to add to that or talk about that later, I think that's that's really valuable and important. Um, do I like art? I do like art. <laughs> what are my goals? Um, that's such a beautiful question too. I think, um, honestly, I think being free and being healthy and being joyous, like being attentive to the present, like whatever feelings are coming, whether they are joy or sadness or anger or pain or whatever. I think that's really important and like continuing to do that. I kind of, I do have this fanciful idea of like starting a family with a husband, but yeah, I mean, there's also the reality of, of living within a capitalist society. So We'll see how that goes. Um, and I really still like to travel and I love doing that. Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, being kind and generous and, and loving people, I think that's, that's all, these are part of my goals. Uh, what do you like to do work? I'm not sure I understand what that means. Um, I, I like doing work. Um, maybe if Nimrod, you wanted to ask it later again, that'd be great. I'm not sure I understand that question. Sorry. Uh, I really, oh my gosh, I want to go back to Indonesia again. Um, I've just been to Bali, which is really touristy, but I want to, yeah, just check it out. I've always wanted to go to the Maldives because they're sinking and I want to go check them out. 
Um, so many parts of Africa, oh my God, working at Next Gen Homework Club and, and like having these amazing Afro-funk dance parties just makes me want to go like to Africa so much. And yeah, um, Central Asia too, I think is really cool. Yeah, these are places that I haven't been, but still would like to do. What has been the best thing about what you do? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think being self-employed gives, there's like quite a bit of uncertainty with it, which is like terrifying sometimes because you don't know when your next paycheck is gonna happen. And you're like, ah, which is why, you know, the Canada's like uh, CERB and CRB has been so, so helpful for artists right now, um, just to give them kind of like a baseline and has been really wonderful. I think a universal basic income is like, great, personally speaking. But um, I think what the best thing about what I do is I think having the freedom to choose and um, being able to like chat with people like this and, and to share. I think, yeah, having the freedom to be honest with every moment of my life. I think that's something that's very rewarding. From all the things you have experienced in your life, what is the one thing you would li love to do for the rest of your life? Oh my gosh, these hard hitting questions. Um, um, okay. Uh, I don't, I honestly, I, I think I, I eat probably. I just love to eat. <laughs> so I would just love to eat for the rest of my life. Uh, one fun fact about me is that uh, I got my ears pierced in January of last year. So not while I was at CBFY. How long been here? Um, uh, I, oh, I, maybe in Canada? Yeah, I've been here for over 20 years define love oh my gosh uh these are i can't even answer that question pass uh what is an experience that has changed your perspective these are like such and more of them more of them are coming so i have three minutes left okay i'm going to maybe scan through some of these questions because these are these are so so, so great, but I will not be able to answer all 18 of these. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. Favorite sport, I like playing tennis. Um, I was born in Hong Kong. What is an experience that has changed your perspective? I think I've spoken to that a few times. Um, yeah, so I'll pass on that question too. What were your initial thoughts when planning your film? That's a great question, uh, Bea. And why did you choose film as your medium of art? Okay, that's a great question. I think this will be the last one. Um, when I was initially planning my film, I was, uh, well, terrified and trepidatious because uh, Paul was like a celebrity and I was like, who am I to do this? Um, and then I recognized that they match made me well because so much of what he was sharing about, you know, how when Chinese people first set, let, set foot in the late 1800s on Can in Canada, um, they were essentially, they were slaves. Like they were indentured workers. They were paid like, 10 cents to the white man's dollar and they were forced to work the most dangerous dispositions. Like they were forced to set off explosives, explosives in the, in the, in the mountains and um, like, you know, tons of them died and they were made, they were made promises by the Chinese, by the Canadian government that were no, that weren't fulfilled, like shipping their bodies back to China for their relatives. Like none of that was fulfilled until much, much later. And so like, these are things that I didn't know about my own history. And now I've started like reading more books and, and understanding that more. And so I think it was during that process that like I was starting recognizing that, oh, I, I am legitimate. Like I am worthy of making this story and what parts 
of this resonate with me will resonate with a wider audience. And so that's, um, that's what I, that those were maybe my initial thoughts. And then why did I choose film as a medium of art? Um, I will be honest and say that it's one medium of art that I'm choosing. Like I said, I love dancing and, and acting and singing and music and like visual arts as well. Like I'm interdisciplinary truly, but I think film has a beautiful way. Like uh, I've often felt tugged by film um, in a, because it is inherently also interdisciplinary. Like it, it, it it encapsulates like visual processes as well as music and there's acting involved and uh, script writing. Um, and it's also really transportable um, and accessible to people like, um, where some other forms are not. So yeah, that's probably what I would say. Okay. Thank you all of you so much for your questions and your attention. Um, I'm going to go back for a little while and um, read through some of these comments that I missed. But um, thank you so much for your time and for listening. And hopefully maybe you caught something from, from this presentation. Jackson, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you for opening up a space for our youth to be real and to feel connection and to feel like they're being heard. Um, thank you for, for being here and, and for sharing and, and for being vulnerable. We're so, so appreciative. My pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm so honored. Thank you for having me and good luck with the rest of your conference today. <laughs> thank you so much, Jackson, for sharing that. I mean, every one of us here could really agree that that documentary is very breathtaking. Yes. And I just want to say that all of us here in the studio <laughs> were actually getting emotional when we were watching it. Yes. <laughs> a lot of us. <laughs> Laura was like, mm. <laughs> all right, babe, you want to share something, right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know the cue. But um, yeah, I honestly just wanted to say thank you because a lot of us were able to empathize with um, your film and also the way that you were sharing your thoughts with us. And thank you for answering my question. <laughs> that was me. But I was, I'm just so excited to see what you have in the future for us. And I am just so proud, you know, being a part of your community. So thank you again mm. for that. And um, did you want to add anything to you? No, I just want to say that I actually met Jackson three years ago. <laughs> It You're was, lucky. <laughs> I'm so lucky. He's very approachable and such a nice person. You know what? That was like the first year and I was so a bit, I want to say so stressed as being an immigrant youth because mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. And then I just met him and it was like very positive person saying that, you know what? This is your chance to be wow. something great. And I think <laughs> all, all of our youths are there are very inspired by his stories. Yes, we yes. can all relate to you, Jackson. Yeah, that yeah. was just really good. Uh, thank you again, Jackson. And we just wanted to say congratulations to Jackson for winning the film grant. And um, I believe it was a $20,000 film grant. Yeah. So, wow, amazing. I cannot wait on um, to see the product and what you're going to do with that grant. And apart from that, uh, thank you for giving us the honor again of joining us today. So. Yeah. So, everyone, <laughs> welcome back again and another flash news wow <laughs> we have heard that you want more performances yes and we want to grant your wishes <laughs> so we have another back-to-back -back performances from nelson mandela alumni Ooh. first is the hawaiian squad <gasps> who will be singing a song from the early 2000s very interesting yeah early 2000s <laughs> and ekam will be the second performer showing uh she's gonna show us her cool Bangra dance moves. Yes. So I was like, I was really excited. That's why I really caught up myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're very excited okay. that it just kept going. And that's completely fine. All yeah. right. And let us welcome our performers. All right.
Are so good. Yes, oh my gosh, they are such diverse youth leaders sharing and inspiring others through their singing and dancing. Oh my gosh, but I think it is time for another door prize to you. Don't You're you think right. so? Okay, so again, if you guys already don't know, the protocol is put your full name on the chat and we will pick you out and you could be our next lucky winner. So what do we have here, Gio? So we have, <laughs> all right, I think everyone actually likes a table board game. Yes. And of course, if you're not lucky enough to win the Super Mario Uno cards, <laughs> we have a Toy Story 4 Uno ah! cards. Woo a nice way to get back on the Uno cards. Yes, oh my gosh. And we got another uh, a Dutch <laughs> Blitz. That's this is the yeah. Dutch Blitz. And of course, the Battleship. Yes. Oh, it's falling down, guys. And let's <laughs> not forget the wonderful co-op $20 gift card. Okay, okay, okay. All right, and I think, Gio, we have we our have, winners. We have our first winner. Yes. Let's all congratulate Jonathan Underbrand. Woo! Woo! Congratulations, yes. Jonathan Underbrand. And just to make sure again, just a friendly reminder, wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you for your prizes. Yes, okay, and let us not forget that the two people are going to be winning this prize. So the second person that wins this prize is Okbazgi Welde. So congratulations, Okbazgi. Um, your youth worker will get in touch with you very, very shortly. So congratulations to the winners! Woo! All 
right, fools. <laughs> so I am feeling a little bit tired. Mm -hmm. um, I have been sitting here for a long time. So I think it is time for another five minute body break. Oh, what I do you think, that. Gio? I love the five minute body yeah? break. Yeah, okay, <laughs> awesome. So grab some water. Don't forget to hydrate, get some snacks, and watch these two amazing videos from the University of Calgary and say, Tomorrow. Tomorrow is not just an idea or a dream. It's the promise of a new day and a better world. Tomorrow belongs to the change makers and the risk takers, the passionate, the daring, and the bold. This is our tomorrow, all of us, together. This is where and how we live, shaped by our community, our neighbors, our friends, and our rivals shaped by those who challenge us to think bigger, move faster, and achieve more. By those who came before us and fashioned this university from sheer determination. We're pioneers at heart, innovators by necessity, and community builders because, well, we're from Calgary, where that legendary can-do spirit has blossomed into a will-do commitment. And like Calgary, this university attracts people from around the world with ambitious dreams and the courage to fulfill them. We educate students to become community builders. We conduct research that changes the world. And we enhance the intellectual, social, and cultural landscape of our region. It's true. Our campuses draw disruptors, instigators, and challengers of convention. Those who seek and share answers to society's greatest challenges because tomorrow demands global attention to challenges we can only begin to imagine. A tomorrow our students are preparing for now and our researchers are striving to understand. A tomorrow we're ready to face, fueled by the energy and passion of our students, postdoctoral scholars, faculty, staff, alumni, donors, and cherished friends. By discovering and creating new ideas that have a meaningful impact on the world around us, we can improve our world and deliver the promise of a new tomorrow together. Good afternoon and welcome to St. News Fire. Hopefully it'll be a busier night in the National Hockey League. The State's big... coming off a big win last week against the Red Deer College. King. The trial should be done by Tuesday. The jury afternoon. will say their charge on Tuesday. Yes. Okay, so the There's judge was Carlin. Okay, well, who's the other one? So that looks yeah, good. Okay. I think. And, and now you're down to about a minute 33. That's perfect. Awesome. That's sports. Now back to more music on Legacy 103. Have fun, face everything, or we go on to that station. We will open in five minutes. Okay, it looks like we're ready for power on the citation. We're on. So my starter's engaged. Fuel is on. We start the pump up slowly. Confirm return flow, then bring it up to higher rates. And then lift off the brake and hit the gas. So now we're hoisting up. You're going to hoist until the tool joint's roughly level with the column. So what you want to do is you want to work with the pendulum as it's swinging, right? So we're going to pick this up and then once you get it, you're going to boom up. Image locations for, for drones. We've come up with this new rover. Three cameras. And the GPS we want to install this module right here. Good, I think we are good to go, just we have to put it together. Welcome back to your regular programming, Power of the Voice. <laughs> Sorry, I was not really excited. The Power of Voice so 2021. I hope everyone of you there enjoyed those two 
post-secondary videos out there, yes. especially available in our city. Mm -hmm. And for those youth who are currently grade 12, make sure to check this amazing schools out there. Yes, oh my gosh. Uh, it's almost time to graduate. <gasps> are you graduating? We are. <laughs> so I think it's time for our last learning session, Dayan. Oh, no. I know, it's just the last. last it's the last, but still worth the wait, right? Oh, 100%. <laughs> I am so excited for this one, Gio. All right. So please let us all welcome Pelche Medal. So Pelche is a cremate Mexican woman residing in Treaty 7. Yes. Right? Here in Treaty 7, yes. Here. <laughs> she is here today to teach us about the importance of storytelling and how we can find the inner storytellers in us. <laughs> I know you're excited because you like storytelling. I, I am so excited. I'm ready for this, Gio. Let's, let's go. Let's go. Let's all everyone get ready because I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to watch a short video first and then we're going to hear from Pelche herself. Woo! Hello, everyone. Thanks so much um, for lending me your ears and your eyes and just space and time. Um, I'm really excited to just um, share my story and share a little bit about how all of us can be storytellers. Um, yeah, like was just shared, I'm gonna share a video um, that um, is just a really important story that I really speak, like I hold, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, the story is shared by Wangari Mathai, which is the first African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, she also started the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, which is they work on empowering communities and women and like conserve environment and just like improve communities. Um, so one of my big role models in my life, um, but I just really wanna share, um, I want you guys to watch this video because it's a really cute story that um, I'll just, I'll share a little bit more about after. We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning and they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless, except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm going to do something about the fire. So it flies to the nearest stream, takes a drop of water and it puts it on the fire and goes up and down, up and down, up and down as fast as it can. In the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals, like the elephant with a big trunk, could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless. And they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small. You can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I am doing the best I can. And that to me is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best Awesome. Um, yeah, I really love that story. Um, it's something that I have to remind myself daily to just do the best that I can. Um, I want to be like the hummingbird. Um, it's, it's really neat because I think in um, all different cultures and um, you'll find a similar story. You know, I, I hear elders um, in my indigenous culture will share a similar story, but there's different animals and um, but it all comes to this lesson of like doing the best that we can. Um, 
And, and the fun of storytelling, you know, storytelling, especially in my culture is how we pass down history, how we pass down information, how we teach our little ones lessons. How do we, um, you know, how we heal because, you know, there's a lot of power in sharing your story um, and stories like this to just remind you, like, you can keep going, you know, like the little life lessons that we, um, yeah, should all kind of carry with us through life. Um, I, yeah, I guess I should share a little bit about me. Um, as shared, I am a cream tea woman. Um, I'm also half Mexican. A lot of my family, um, is from the Treaty 4, um, territory in Saskatchewan. Um, I am currently a youth coordinator at Canada Bridges. Um, and my role a lot of the time is just storytelling, listening to stories, being able to give space for people to share their stories. Um, and so I'll say the word stories about 200 times in the next couple of minutes, um, cause it's really my life and it, I, I just find so much value in it. Um, there's so much power in it, power of our voices, right? Um, yeah, so I wanted um, to share that like our, our stories have a past, a present and a future. So if we talk about the past, I share a little bit more about my story. Um, I was born in San Diego and, um, I don't know why, whether the San Diego weather can't be here, but it's not, um, <laughs> but definitely glad to be in Canada. The people here and the friends that I've met and the opportunities I've had, um, wouldn't have been given to me if I stayed in the States. Um, but I come from a broken home. My parents are divorced. Um, and so when they divorced, we moved to Canada. Um, that was a hard transition for me because down in the States, I had all of my Mexican family. Um, and up here, it was a different culture. It was a different new school. Um, I was starting fresh and that was really hard. Um, you know, not, let alone we're dealing with the whole not um, having our dad in our lives, but now we're trying to figure out life and it was hard. Um, but we were managing and I've slowly gotten into the rhythm and slowly found friends. Um, but I just had this like, this struggle of like not really feeling like I fit in anywhere. Um, you know, I like simple things of like, coming here and I didn't know the Canadian anthem. I knew the American, but I didn't know the Canadian. So that took me a little bit to learn. I learned it, but still like, it was just, it was almost embarrassing, I guess, or just like, just made me feel different, right? Like I should have known. Um, also moving up here, you know, I got to be a more part of my indigenous culture. Um, my great granny, I would spend every summer with her and she would teach me how to jig and how to knit and sew and how to bake. And I really appreciated those memories. But especially being someone who's Métis, you're and sometimes can be placed in this, like you're, you're like you're a half, you're right, like you're a half breed. So you're either too white or you're too brown, like you don't really fit. And so this like, this theme happened in my life of just like feeling like I don't fit. Um, later on, when my mom got really sick, um, I had to take on taking care of my siblings and being 14 year, years old and taking care of three little ones is really hard. Um, I didn't, I felt like a little bit of my childhood was taken away and I couldn't really relate to my peers because they were off having fun and just doing school regularly, but I had to be a mom. And again, this theme of like, who am I? Like, I'm not like everyone else. I'm different. Um, kind of like stuck with me and it, it really clouded, um, clouded my mind and clouded who I was. You know, I was, I so desperately wanted to be like everyone else. And I couldn't see that everyone was had their own struggles or their own differences. And that's what makes us so powerful and what brings um, really unique perspectives and diversity. But all I could see was like this fantasy of what I thought a perfect person would be. And so I really, 
I really started wearing these masks of like trying to be perfect or trying to um, be some, something that I'm not, be the strong person, this fun person, this person who has it all together, um, this person who a lot of the times I didn't want to share my culture. Um, so I pretended to be something else or not really practice my culture or like share about it. Um, I struggled so long to just fit in. Um, and then when I started having, um, really bad anxiety and depression struggles, it was just another thing to add to this like list of like, I'm different, I'm abnormal, I'm not going to fit in and hiding, hiding anxiety, hiding depression isn't good. You know, eventually you're just going to have a blow up. Eventually it's going to become too much because that's not, that's not how you're going to conquer mental illness. That's not how you're going to um, find the tools that you need. And so I had to get on this journey of like being okay with who I am and doing the best that I can, just like that hummingbird. And so a big part of my healing journey and realizing that people have their own struggles and we're different is telling my story. There's so much healing in that, like not having to wear this mask of I'm not perfect, like I'm perfect or, you know, I don't deal with anxiety or <laughs> I'm not this happy person that everyone was seeing, you know, I'm sad. And when I shared my story, it wasn't this person having the answers for me or being able to, I don't know, tell me what I need to do. It was simply like, it opened up the space for other people to share their story and say like, Hey, I went through that too. Or I totally, I totally get that. And so there's this like mutual, safe, vulnerable space of storytelling. Um, and from there, I like, I realized like what happened was this kind of ripple, you know, I shared my story and then this person would share a bit of their story. And then I was like, well, that feels really, really good. And I learned so much from that interaction. And so I just took it further. I kept sharing my story and you would see the, then these people would share their story and it just like rippled out. Um, and so yeah, sharing stories have been really key in my healing and my growth and my happiness. Um, because I heard other share, other people share their story, it gave me courage to do the same. Um, and so that's why I'm standing here today to encourage and stress the importance of storytelling. So that's kind of my past. And so we bring it to the present. My anxiety is still part of my life. Um, I'm fighting to not let it consume me and steal my joy. Uh, I still struggle living one day at a time sometimes. Um, but I'm using the wisdom I've learned and the encouragement of others um, for support. And every time I share my story, I realize I'm not alone, um, that this act of braver, bravery might be fueling, some, fueling someone else um, who's in the same place. Um, It doesn't have to be, you know, getting on a space like this. It can be merely having like a conversation with someone. I'm just being open and vulnerable. Um, so yeah, like take time to listen to each other. Um, our wisdom gained from venturing through life is not to be wasted. What we learn from sharing our stories is um, really the ability to see beyond it and really combat the ugly. And so that's another part of my story. You know, when I felt like I wasn't fitting in um, and I was kind of hiding my culture. Today, I'm so proud of my culture and the things, um, the things that I get to share, you know? And I think in the last year, we've seen a lot of the ugly, you know, we saw um, that racism <laughs> is, I think a lot of people thought it wasn't a big issue or like they were just kind of pushing it to the side. And this year it really came to light. And so I want to be a part of um, the storytellers that are telling their stories of struggle and being proud of who we are so that we can really combat this. And, um, you know, it, we have future generations to think about. Um, so that's what brings us to the future of our stories. Um, our stories can encourage the next generations. They can prepare us for hardships ahead, but they can make change. Um, and so I really want to encourage everyone to be really 
proud of where they are right now. And you've already accomplished so, so much and you hold lessons and wisdom um, to be helping others and um, yeah, to really make, to make your own ripples. Um, you know, you have so much power within you. Um, don't, don't be quiet, be bold, share your stories. Um, we're all storytellers. Uh, and so I wanted to do a little bit of an activity today to kind of help us start this storytelling because it, it's hard. It's, it's a vulnerable space and sometimes we don't know where to start. Um, and so a simple activity that I use is called, who am I? So we'll go through each question. And what I want you guys to do is just type in the chat, the answer to the question. Um, or if you don't feel like sharing, that's totally okay too. You don't have to type in the chat. You can just write it down somewhere. Okay. So the who am I activity just kind of gives you a way to summarize your story, a quick way to share your story. Um, so the first question is, what is one word you would use to describe yourself um, to summarize who you are? So just one word. Um, for me, I would say I am, I'm strong. Um, so in the chat, if everyone wants to just write one word that they think they would use to describe themselves. Determined, intense, I like these. Hardworking. Nice, persistent, creative, these are all good ones. Okay, <clears throat> so now that everyone has these words, um, the next question is, how do you think you became this word? So how do you think you became strong? How do you think you became mindful? How do you think you became creative? Um, were there are certain events or people that contributed, contributed to you being selfless or positive or spiritual or open-minded? Um, so feel free to type those answers in the chat. So um, I said strong. So how do I think I became strong? What were certain events or people that contributed to me being strong? Um, my... I think it's my, why I'm strong is because I have such a good community around me that when I'm not so strong, they are the ones motivating me, encouraging me, holding me up um, so that I can stay strong. I'm strong because I have a generation of strong women behind me who um, have made it possible for me to be here. And so I want to honor them and keep going, you know, and I want to encourage all the other people who feel like they can't they don't fit in or feel weak that you can be strong. I love these answers. Okay, so the next question is, how would you define the word that you use to describe? So how would you define strong? How would you define positive? How would you define spiritual? Um, I think my definition of strength it has really changed. I think strength is not being the person who's put together all the time or doesn't cry or <laughs> doesn't show emotion. Um, strength to me is someone who's willing to be honest um, and share even the hard parts, someone who's willing to, <laughs> someone who's willing to, um, I think, keep going, I guess, like we might have moments where we feel stuck, but you just keep going. Um, I kind of covered the second one, but what does it mean for you to be strong? So what does it mean for you to be positive? What does it mean for you to be open-minded? These are really great answers. being able to see the good in times of struggle. I like that. Um, so next question for you to jot down or answer is where does this quality come from? 
Um, I think my strength comes from my, my, my faith, my spirituality in God. I think my, this quality comes from these mountains that we all have to tackle in life. I think this quality comes from seeing other people be strong. Past mistakes, that's a good one. Oh, there's an experience. Love it. Okay, so the next question is, why does the world need more people who are resilient, who are strong, who are open-minded, who are spiritual, who are persistent? Why does the world need more people who are, who are, who are, are the words that you described? I think the world needs people who are, are strong um, because all of us go through really hard times. The world has been going through a really hard time in the last year. Um, and so we need people to be able to push us forward, to help us, um, yeah, to encourage us and motivate us when we are feeling weak or we aren't as strong. Um, <laughs> These are really great answers. To make history, I like that. Um, okay, so the next question is, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? So this is just anything. And this is an intense question. This is a, a vulnerable question, but it, it gives people insight into who you are. And um, it it's... I don't know. I've learned so much from this because I'll have people share what their hopes and dreams are for the future. And if I've known them for a long time and I look back, I'm like, hey, do you remember when you said this? And it's really neat to see if they've changed directions, they found something else or they reached those hopes and dreams. Um, so some of my hopes and dreams for the future is um, to go back to school. I really want to go back to school. I think um, I always make excuses why I can't, um, I think COVID was a good cover too, because I'm like, oh, I can't do online school, but I am going to hold myself accountable. You guys can too, um, but I want to go back to school. I don't know what for yet, but oh, I love, someone wrote to be happy. I love that. And then the last question is, how will you be part of seeing these hopes and dreams become reality? So I want to go back to school. How will I be part of seeing this thing come to reality is I got to be accountable. <laughs> I've got to get people beside me to encourage me and keep me going. Um, obviously, I have to work so that I can pay for school. Um, but I know that my strength and me doing the best that I can, I will get, I will get there. Awesome. I loved all of these answers. Um, this activity I use all the time just to like start conversations with youth or, in, it'd be kind of weird to be to go to your friend and just be like, who are you? And give me a word. But um, you can kind of ask those questions, like ask your friends and your, and your classmates, like, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? You know, what is, um, what is your story, I guess? Like just, um, yeah, I think <laughs> we're all storytellers. It's how we pass information. Um, I'm really, really thankful um, that you guys listened to mine, that, um, you know, that stories connect, um, connect us, it reveals that we're not so alone or lost. We're not really meant to walk through life alone. Um, yeah, I wanna leave, leave space for any questions. And thanks again. Um, Calgary Bridge Foundation for Youth for having me. This has been really, really fun. <laughs> Thank you guys. 
Thanks for listening. This has been really fun today. Thank you so much, Palshe, uh, for being vulnerable and sharing your truth and your story. I'm sure that all of our youth um, were able to connect to you somehow. And it just goes to show that that power of sharing. Um, even though we all have come from different places and look different, uh, we have a lot of the same stories to share. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Pelche, we've got a few good minutes to go through some questions. Let's take advantage of the fact that she's here with us um, to, to ask some really good questions. So I'll just let you go through the chat as they come in. Um, what age group do you mostly work with? Um, for a long time, I was working with like grades um, six to 12. But in my job now, we mostly work with people who are 16 to 30 years old. Um, and we most, our invitations right now are to work with Indigenous communities. And so um, the two main communities that I work with is Six Sigga and Morley, um, which is the, Six Sigga is the Blackfoot nation. And then we have Ihe Nakoda, which is out in Morley. Um, so yeah, work for, with individuals who are 16 to 30. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for liking my eye makeup. How did you, okay, the who am I questions is actually um, what we use at work. Um, um, we, it's a really neat tool. We sometimes use it in interviews. Um, we just use it to get to know each other. Um, I use it like in workshops like this. Um, it's just a really neat little activity questions. Um, it doesn't always have to be like a like questionnaire. Sometimes we do this thing, um, we make like a timeline and we kind of answer those questions through like a little timeline. Um, and if anyone wants the who am I questions after this, I can definitely send it um, to the team here to pass it on. What is one thing you would tell young people who are struggling to accept who they are, where they come from, and what their realities are? Um, that question reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if you guys know who Brene Brown is. Um, <laughs> but her quote is, um, our lives are a collection of stories, truths about who we are, what we believe, what we came from, how we struggle, and how we are strong. When we can let go of what people think and own our own story, we gain access to our worthiness, the feeling that we are enough, just as we are, and that we are worthy of love and belonging. Um, and so I would... I would say that, own your story. Um, you know, we are all coming from different backgrounds, um, different struggles, but the one thing we have in common is stories um, and the ability to encourage each other and to love on each other. And, um, you know, if you're really struggling to accept who you are, you know, find a community that will tell you otherwise, you know, I have amazing friends in my life right now who tell me the truth because I think when you're in your own head, it's so easy to listen to those lies that say you're ugly, you're not smart enough, you're, you know, you don't fit in. Um, so really important to find friends and family who are willing to um, and who can speak to you when you're letting the lies take over. Um, yeah, so find community, find storytellers, find people who encourage you and love on you. Um, what would you say to youth who is in a similar situation to the one you were in, where they were taking a parental oral with their siblings and losing some of what it means to be a child? Hmm. <laughs> this is a good question, but it's also a hard one. Um, I think depends on your circumstance, but I've really had to set boundaries. Like now my siblings, two of them are adults and I can't be their parent anymore. And I wanna be their sister, I wanna be their friend. And so I've had to learn how to talk and communicate better with them. Cause I sometimes have the mom voice that comes out or I was like trying to 
<laughs> like protect them, but I was stopping them from living their own life and making their own mistakes to learn from. Um, but really important as adults, as youth who um, feel like they've lost a bit of their childhood or things like that, it's really important to play. Even as an adult, it's really important to have fun. You know, you have you have that inner child spirit that you still need to feed, that you still need to encourage. And like part of the healing journey now is like healing a lot of those childhood wounds. Um, yeah, I think it's funny, like I felt like I was really mature when I was a teenager and now I feel less mature because I, th I think like there's this inner child that's coming out because it was so starving for fun. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like I get to be goofy and watch cartoons and, you know, play. I think that's really important. Have you noticed a generation difference? Do they, ha do they have different problems and opinions and such? That's a tough one <laughs> because I think we all can experience, like some of our parents have very strict and old ways um, and we're in a, we're in a time now that we can get information out faster. We have the internet, we have social media, um, and our, I think values have changed over the generations. And so there is generational differences. Um, you know, my great granny was the one who shared my culture with me, but my, my mom and my aunt didn't really, because I think they were also trying to fit in for a long time. Um, and so when my great granny passed away, it was really hard because I felt like my, my knowledge keeper, my source of my culture had gone with that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding community now and I'm like diving into my own culture and I'm doing the work because that's something that I really want to keep alive. Um, but yeah, I definitely, <laughs> I feel like I'm less... <laughs> what's the word I'm a bit freer than how my parents would want me to be um it's just because I you know I love people so much and I don't know if everything's so black and white as my parents see it um so there's different definitely different opinions uh why storytelling what made you choose that storytelling <laughs> to me it's like it's it's how I find friends. It's how I find healing. It's how, um, you know, I get information. Like I love learning. I love learning about people. I love learning about cultures. I love learning um, just new things. And so storytelling is really at the heart of people. Um, yeah. What does family mean to you since you had issues with your own family? Were you able to find a sense of family elsewhere? That's actually so great. <laughs> I did. I have an amazing family of roommates and friends. And it's so funny because it's like, yes, my, my, my born into family is my, my family and I love them. They're my first family, but this new family that I found, my found family, um, really are such a blessing and what gives me the ability to be here today and sharing. And I just, you know, I love them so much. <laughs> what is the age difference between me and my siblings? Um, my, so I have two brothers and a sister. So me and my sister are five years apart. My youngest brother is 13 years younger than me, and my other brother is three years younger than me. Do you ever feel pressure to just be one part of your culture? You're either Indigenous or Mexican. Um, I do, okay, I don't know. If, now I don't feel as much pressure, but like when I'm at the, I'm a part of a Mexican foundation in Calgary, and so we put on events and so, when I'm there, I'm very much more Mexican and, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing more of like the Mexican um, jewelry or clothes or just like feeling that culture. Um, but 
I think I feel less, not that I feel pressured, but I really like, I'm really diving into my indigenous culture because it's something that I don't have like a, like a wealthy source to just share information. I wasn't raised with it. And so um, it's definitely something that I'm doing the work to dive into. And because it's the communities that I work in and um, you know, I really am working towards like decolonization and indigenization in Canada. I think I am very proud to be indigenous. And I like, I think that's the one that I'm, I talk about more or share about more. If you don't have experience to tell stories, can you be a storyteller? Every single one of us are storytellers. We all have funny stories to share, embarrassing stories to share, things we've learned. Um, our life is, is full of wisdoms and lessons to share with each other. Um, you, I think sometimes it's hard though. Like I, I know every one of us has stories, but it's hard to share a story. It's a scary place sometimes and you don't know how people are gonna react. Um, I think if we're letting that voice in our head say like, oh, our, our, our story isn't good enough or, um, you know, there's someone out there who has a better story. Like that's, that's not true. We all have something to contribute. We all have powerful voices. We all um, have a time and place when, you know, our stories can help people. And, you know, like right now you might feel like, oh, I can't be a storyteller, but there's someone else who feels that way. And so who's going to, who's going to take the step? Who's going to be the one to break that wall down so that that other person feels encouraged to do that? Um, yeah, everyone has stories. I think like if you, if you weren't born in Canada, you have a story to share. Where you come from? Um, why did you come here? What's, what's the differences? What's the experience? You know, like if you're um, going to school, like you have so much stories to tell because that's stressful and that's an accomplishment and super proud of you. So lots of stories. Um. <laughs> what is your favorite food in movies? Um, okay, I really love Mexican food. Um, and I'm, I've been diving into how to make like really traditional Mexican dishes. And so tamales is a really good one. It's kind of like, it's in a corn husk and inside you put like filling. So that's really good. Um, and movies, I love action movies. I really don't like chick flicks. Um, I love Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and things like that. <laughs> What's my favorite color? Uh, my favorite color is probably like the color of my nails. Like a, I forget what it's called, like puce. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone for listening and having me. Um, this has been really fun and yeah, I hope to do this again soon. Shay, thank you so much for coming to our conference today, for sharing your story and for giving us the, the tools and the encouragement to also share ours. Um, I know that our youth have loved learning about you and learning from you. So we are so, so grateful to you for having joined us today. Um, thank you so, so much. Thank you. See you. <laughs>
<laughs> we have a letter board. <laughs> All right, and we have some journals and pens. And we, I, and we have a call gift card. And an arrow bar. <laughs> so you guys already know the drill. Make sure you write your full name on the chat box, okay? And don't forget to write your full name and your youth worker will be in touch with you very, yeah. very soon. I mean, who would not even want the letter board? Yeah, I wish I had that when I was a kid, you know? It would be so easy to write your to-do list. To-do list, like maybe just trying to, you know, um, Tell more about your life, saying like living my best life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or to do assignments, right? To oh do yes, assignments. exactly. Like reminders. And of and course, the co-op gift card isn't just about buying groceries and vegetables. Mm -hmm. You can also use this to purchase some goodies. Oh yes, yeah. for sure, for sure. Candies, of course, sweet and sour candies. <laughs> <laughs> what is sweet and sour? I like, I like. Um, oh, what, what? My sweet, favorite one was the hot Cheetos. Oh, the hot Cheetos. Yeah, so I'm. I don't know, I kind of want that gift card now, but it's okay. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about this really cute journal, guys. Mm. So I really <laughs> love how this is, the front is like made of paper, because talking about climate justice, <laughs> this this is a really good way to bring more sustainability um, and basically protect our environment more right. just from using less plastic and mm -hmm. a little bit more paper. Actually, I have a question for Bea. Oh, no. We tell the um, the uh, the winner for this prize. Wow, okay. What does it say to the journal? The journal says, believe in yourself. <laughs> and whoever won this really believe in themselves because uh, we do have three winners for this. Woo! And do we know who those winners are, Gio? I think I know the first winner. Oh, my gosh. The first winner for this prize is goes to Alizba Amir. Woo! Congratulations, yes. Alizma Amir. Congratulations, mm -hmm. congratulations. And, and another friendly friendly reminder <laughs> is just wait for a youth worker to keep in touch with you regarding the claiming of your prices. Yes, of course. And yeah. I think we have our second winner now. Wow. And our second winner is, drum roll please, Gio. Hiba Al Muhammad. Woo! Woo! All right. So Hiba Al Muhammad, uh, just wait for a youth worker to get in touch with you. And again, they will be the ones to um, remind you about your prize. Awesome. And then the last of the winner. But not the for, least. Yeah, not the least. For this prize is Ghost to Can I please get a drum roll first? <laughs> Ghost to Cozy Ibello. Congratulations, Cozy. Yes. Just make sure that another friendly reminder. Just wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you. Yes, yes. You so you guys have to wait for that. Anyways, congratulations to those three prize winners. Uh, I really wish I could have that, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, now it is time for another performance, Gio. Woo! So our next performer is Nicolo Sari, who will be doing a mashup cover oh. of One Dance and Hasta El Amancer. <laughs> All right, let's All right. get it on, Nicolo. Baby, I like your style. Rips on your waist from way back way You know that I don't play Street's not safe, but I never run away Even when I'm away OT, OT There's never much love when we go OT I pray to make it back in one piece I pray, I pray That's why I need a one dance Got an NSC in my hand one more time before I go Higher powers taking the hold on me I need a one dance Got a Hennessy in my hand One more time before I go Higher powers taking the hold on me Baby I like your style Strength and guidance All that I'm wishing for my friends Nobody makes it for my ends I had to bust up the silence You know you gotta stick by me As soon as you see the text reply me I don't wanna spend time fighting Como tu te llama yo no sé De donde llegaste ni pregunté Lo único que sé es que quiero con usted Quedarme contigo hasta el amanecer Go 
como tú te llamas yo no sé de dónde llegaste ni pregunté único que sé es que quiero con usted quedarme contigo hasta el amanecer cause I need a one dance so one more time before I go higher powers taking the hold cause I need a one dance Quedarme contigo hasta el amanecer Thank you, Nico, for the wonderful performance. It was so perfect, Bea, for the transition for our final guest speaker of the day. Wait, Jill, I'm, we switched. Oh. Like, Oh, oh, all right, let's go back. <laughs> That's my chair. Okay. okay, but at least our heads are not cut off this time. Yeah. <laughs> we were standing the cattle, right? Yeah. So <laughs> just, to, just to give our viewers more information about the guest speaker, her name is Sarah al mm. So Sarah, she moved here 15 years ago with her family oh, from Egypt. Egypt. <gasps> Another, oh my gosh. Another, right? oh, and that's... she also graduated from University of Calgary Three years ago. Three years ago, Bea. <laughs> We're so, so young back then. <laughs> and now she is working as a process engineer in waste management. Yes, we Woo! love that. We got it, girl. We love we it. We got it. We love to see it. Kudos yes. for that. So she is here today with us to share a personal story about how she navigated and overcame a life-changing accident that happened to her before. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear the story. I know. So let's all check out her video first and listen to her herself. I've been with Worley for about two years now, um, and I work as a process engineer, more specifically in EIT, which means engineering training. I was born in Egypt and I moved to Canada when I was 11 and we settled in Calgary in 2008 so I would say a Cairo and Calgary. <laughs> I started um, at the University of Calgary in 2012 and I, during my degree I did two internships. One was in drilling at Shell for four months and the other one was in Foothills Gas Operations also at Shell for a year. Um, so that was after my third year. And then, yeah, I graduated at the end of 2017. And I've been with Worldly since February 2018. I've done a lot of different projects and a lot of them have been well pads, but there's still a ton of stuff to learn. I would say there's two major events in my life that, um, that have shaped who I am. The first one was immigrating to Canada um, just because it adapted it, it taught me to adapt to change and I feel like that has carried over into my adult life because I don't feel like I shy away from opportunities or new things as much as I maybe would have if if I didn't go through that experience and the second event that has shaped who I am is uh, a car accident that I was in with my family at the end of 2016 um, and that was extremely life-changing and it really impacted who I am today more than anything. I spent nine months in hospital because of several injuries and it eventually led to the amputation of my left leg below the knee. Um, so that was in itself an experience, um, but to me sometimes that's minor compared to having lost like my parents and one of my sisters in the accident. So that was a really big process of recovery and dealing with grief and emotions and uh, dealing with life past the accident um, but I've had I had a really good support system that got me through all of it and I feel so thankful for it. I would say in my everyday life does having a prosthetic impact me maybe at work specifically I would say it doesn't impact how I perform my job because it's mostly at a desk um, it does impact me in the sense that some days my leg doesn't feel good it hurts uh, the prosthetic doesn't fit properly I can't wear the right shoes stuff like that and honestly I feel so thankful to even have a prosthetic leg because I know there's so many people around the world 
that have amputations for different reasons and don't have a prosthetic and I feel if that's the case then your life becomes so 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 difficult I would say like to me if I hear the word disability or if I say I have a disability I my gut feeling tells me something is wrong because I don't feel that way and to me it just the word it's like it says you can't do something and I don't want to feel that way about myself and so no I don't consider it a disability and I feel like we should maybe change that word eventually in the dictionary to like differently abled or something like that um, that maybe is just highlights the fact that you do things differently not necessarily that you're not able to do things and yeah I've been able to play sports and like do things yeah sometimes it's hard to walk in the snow yes sometimes it's difficult to do things but I'm trying to enjoy the process of figuring out ways of doing things I feel okay working in a male-dominated industry. I noticed some patterns, yes, but I feel okay working here and I feel like a big part of that, or I believe that a big part of that, is my upbringing. So we were three girls. And my parents knew that life was challenging and had presented all these challenges. And so they raised us in a way to be able to take on anything and to not shy away from uh, challenges that come up or new opportunities. So. I personally feel like the way I was raised has helped me so much in being able to work in a male-dominated industry and not necessarily feel threatened or, oh, I can never get there because I'm a girl. Like, I don't necessarily feel that way and I really appreciate my parents, like, playing a big part in that. My answer to that is maybe I have faced discrimination, maybe I've had people judge me or treat me a certain way because of certain things and the way I necessarily, like I deal with that is I just sort of uh, give people the benefit of the doubt, deal with that by just changing someone's opinion through my actions. Not necessarily being like why would you treat me this way or whatever but just the way I try to conduct myself and how what I believe is right and how I like to carry myself and then yeah and then I give people the benefit of the doubt and and I and and try not to look into things too much because maybe someone says something and they don't necessarily mean something by it so try to judge people more by their intentions as opposed to looking for reasons to be upset at someone what I would tell my younger self is I think it's super important to invest time in building a good support system and I, th I know that's like super cliche but it, it's so so important to have people whether it's your family or outside your family or a mix friends co-workers whatever that you can reach out to and that you feel comfortable with and also have the same values as you because that's how you connect is they, they see th things the same way that you do uh, the other thing is I would tell anyone to spend time learning about themselves and know what makes what makes them feel upset why it makes them feel upset what makes them happy why it makes them happy throughout your life you get a lot of things that come your way so you have to be able to navigate them and to make sure that you're all also always learning from all these experiences that come your way the last thing is I would just tell my younger self to enjoy the process of growth as opposed to always focusing on the end point but understanding and accepting and appreciating that all the challenges that we go through are a part of a growth process and to appreciate that because we're truly privileged to have the opportunity to grow as individuals through our experiences. Right, so hi everyone. Um, I just want to introduce myself again. So my name is Sarah Al Kadi, or if you're an Arabic speaker, it's Sara Al Adi. Um, and this video that you just saw, I did last year for International Women's Day, but I still thought it would be good to show because I think it gives a really good overview of who I am as a person, and then also some of the key experiences that um, have shaped the person that I am today. And I think it also touches on a lot of important topics that I think many of you can relate to on some level and that 
all tie into my newcomer experience and my journey growing up here. So I wanted to zoom in a little bit on the last part of the video where I give advice to my younger self. Um, and if you think about it, I'm 26 years old. So advice to my younger self is really advice to youth in your age group. Um, so I thought I would build on two things specifically. The first one um, is the importance of taking the time um, to build a really good support system. And I wanted to elaborate a little bit on how I did that. Um, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of being involved in your community, whether that's through school or volunteering or attending this conference or even going to um, gatherings with your family, which I think a lot of people try to get out of. And I know it's difficult right now with COVID, but um, growing up, I would always go to all these gatherings and I'd meet these family friends and form all these great relationships. And these people are the exact same people that I now call my support system and that I call my family. Um, they're the same people that came to the hospital after my accident and brought me food and waited for me after all my surgeries. Um, another example is when I first joined or when I first started university, I joined a lot of student clubs on campus where I met so many people that I connected with on so many levels. I met people that were immigrants like me. I met people who were just as passionate about world development as I was. Um, and I also met people that had perspectives that were completely different than mine. And I learned so much from them too. So these diverse experiences have shaped me and they continue to shape me every day. Um, I was also part of a mentorship program, um, and my mentor at the time helped guide me through my career choices, um, and I'm still in touch with her to this day, eight years later. Um, so I feel like a lot of us are taught that grades are the most important thing, and they are important. They absolutely are important, um, and I cared a lot about my grades growing up, and if I was to go back to school, I still would, um, but I just wanted to highlight the importance of being involved in the community. So the main takeaway here is to continue being part of organizations like the Calgary Bridge Foundation and others, because through those experiences, you don't only meet great people, but you also learn so much about yourself and what your passions are. Um, the next point I want to touch on is developing your identity. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how my identity has evolved over time. And when I first came to Canada, I was only 11 years old, and in an attempt to fit in, I would listen to all this Western music. And then even when I'd go back to Egypt, um, and I'd be, you know, at gatherings with my cousins, I would, wouldn't really embrace the local culture, and I'd ask them to play, you know, Western music instead of Arabic music. And then now when I look back at it, it's crazy how much I've changed and I now listen to Arabic music most of the time, but I also um, watch a lot of shows in English. And this point isn't really about music or about shows. It's more about highlighting one of the things that I've loved so much about growing up in Canada. And that's having the opportunity to form, you know, my own culture. Um, I've gotten to blend parts of the Arab culture that I learned about so much growing up. And then also other cultures that I've been exposed to over the years, given that we live in a multicultural country. And I took what I liked from each of them and I formed my own, you know, blend and therefore my own identity along with it. Um, I feel like I can identify with so many cultures, but at the same time, identify with none of them. Um, and so over your journey, you'll find yourself unsure about where you belong. And sometimes what you're supposed to do may not be the same as what you feel is the right thing to do. Um, and that's okay. It's part of your journey. And over time, you'll find yourself developing into your own person and Honestly, that is one of the greatest and most empowering feelings ever. So next time you go to school and you feel like you don't fit in, or next time you disagree with your parents about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, or next time you find yourself unsure about what part of the world is really home for you, just remember that this is all part of your journey and it's a journey that you'll look back at and you'll be so proud of how far you've come. And you're also going to be able to use the power of your own voice to help others with their journey. 
So that's all I have for today. And thanks so much for having me. Sarah, thank you so much um, for sharing your, your story. Um, and it was beautiful to see that video and to be able to see how much you've grown as a person. Um, and it's, it's incredibly inspirational because I think it shows our youth that they can do anything. They really can accomplish anything. Um, I'm wondering if you would be okay with answering some questions for the next five minutes or so? Yeah, definitely. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so if anybody has got some questions for Sarah, maybe we'll do one or two questions, whatever we can fit into the next five minutes. And I'll let you just look through the chat, Sarah, and pick the ones that you'd like to answer. Okay. Um, what's my favorite food? I was thinking about this when, <laughs> before, when this question was asked. And I don't know. I like a lot of different foods. Um, I would say maybe Italian food, famosa pizza all the way. And um, do you speak Arabic? Yes, I do. I do speak Arabic. Um, yeah, I speak Egyptian Arabic, but I also understand like Syrian, Lebanese, all that from the shows. Um, have you ever felt your cultures conflicting and how did you accept that or solve it? I literally feel this every single day. It is like such a continuous, not, I don't want to say problem in my life. It's just a challenge. It's something that I have to deal with. And I think, um, I mean, I just use all my resources. I love to discuss all like, you know, my thoughts with my family, friends and people that have gone through similar experiences. Like I said, I, when I joined university, um, I, I, I like met all these great people and a lot of them have gone through similar experiences with immigration and like conflicting identities and all of that. And so I discuss it a lot with them. And I would say it's a case by case basis. And I think over time, as I like over time, I just kind of start to figure out what my values are and what the main things are that I care about um, that are priority for me. And then that's kind of how I make my decisions on what to keep apart, like as part of a culture and what to drop. But it's a really case by case type thing. Um, so where was I born? I was born in Cairo, Egypt. Um, what do you like about Egypt? I like the people and I like um, how there's always um, everyone likes to stay up late. I love the weddings. I would say the weddings are my favorite part because they're a lot of fun, um, really big gatherings. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like a lot of things about Egypt. But I would say I think like the culture, what I've loved the most over time is just um, how everyone's like really there for each other. There's like these like strong kind of family values, even between friends. So I really like that part of the culture. Um, how many languages do you speak? I speak English, Arabic. And I would say French, but it's a little rusty. So I need to practice a little bit. Uh, one fun fact about you. I joined uh, the rowing club, like the Calgary Rowing Club in 2019. So I didn't actually grow up playing sports. I, like, I was in swimming when we were in Egypt. And then when we moved here, um, I stopped doing sports. And um, so it was really nice to get into something and be like, okay, I can actually do a sport even on 24, like not, I don't have to be super young. Um, so yeah, that's my fun fact. I'm still uh, rowing, but I'm trying to get into other sports too on the side. Um, do you feel it's empowering for Egypt and its tourism industry? Ooh, as the aircraft sector moves more and more to local scientists and teams instead of foreign teams. Hmm. I think so. I think it is um, important to support local. I think we need to like help the local people grow and develop and not always rely on foreign, I guess, teams or aids or all of that. But I think it's a very complex question. There's a lot of um, aspects to it, funding, uh, politics, all of that stuff. So I really wish these questions were easier to answer, but I find every time I try to dig into anything like that, I just find it a very complicated question. So <laughs> um, what advice would you give to someone who has suffered 
a setback? Mm, I would say, okay, that's a hard question. I would say to always remember the blessings that you have in your life. And not that someone else has it worse, because I really think then you're just kind of minimizing the struggle that you go through. But I think it's important to build your confidence and always reflect on other times when you've suffered setbacks and how you've overcome them. And if it's not you, then other people that have suffered suffered setbacks and that have overcome them. Um, and especially when, when they're people that are close to you, like your family friends or your friends or coworkers and all of that. So I think it's really important to like draw inspiration from other people's experiences and the things that happen um, around you. Um, do you want your kids to maintain a bicultural identity? Good question. I also think about that. Yes, I think so. I think it's, um, I love other cultures. I love learning about other cultures and I think it's great to embrace cultures. So I really um, am all for embracing our cultures and maintaining them and really enjoying the best parts of them. So um, yes, definitely. Do I live in Canada? Yes, I've been in Canada since 2005 and I Actually, I live in Calgary. So I've been in Calgary since 2008 and I haven't left. Like I've done like a study abroad program for six weeks and little things like that. But I've lived in Calgary for a long time. How Sarah, you thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Just the, the okay. purposes of time, we'll have to move along. But everyone has asked some really great questions. And I love how interested they are in knowing more about you. Um, yeah. Thank you for being so open to sharing your story with us and sharing a part of yourself, Sarah. We're, we're so lucky to have had you with our conference today. Yeah, of course. And if anyone wants to reach out, um, feel free with other questions or anything. Feel free to reach out. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. I, wow, I applaud you for really turning your adversity into strength. You know, not a lot of people can do that. So please, please, please continue to inspire people and you such as these wonderful youth that we have here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay, Gio. <laughs> <laughs> what is in your bag? All right, thank you for a question. For, thank you for questioning this bag. It's actually <laughs> going to be for our next door prizes. Oh, Woo. okay. So I we see. have a catapult from National Geography. Wow. <laughs> and we got another watch. A watch again. All right, start putting those names in the chat box, everyone. Your full name. All right. Full name. And we have a co op card. A co op $20 gift card. And of course, your battleship! And a battleship. All right. Oh. <laughs> and Twix. And Twix chocolate bar. Awesome. And I think, Gio, we, we now have a winner. Okay, so mm. who is the winner, Gio? The winner for these awesome prizes that you can see all your, in your screen is Sanai Baye. Congratulations, yes! Sanai Baye. And friendly reminder, just wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you. Yes. <laughs> so again, the youth worker will be in touch with you soon. And now as we move along, congratulations to Sanai. Um, but since we keep giving out prizes, of course, we still mm. have to keep going with our performances as well. So here is another back-to-back -back performance from Mark San Jose, who is a mentorship alumni mm -hmm. and is now living in Toronto. Ah. Yes, <laughs> awesome. And another performance is, we are lucky to see another performance from our dancing duo, wow. Love Preet and Simran Preet for their Bangra Gida dance. So wow. let's all give them a round of applause. <laughs> Matanda na Sana'y Di tayo magbago Kailanman Nasaan man Ito ang Pangarap ko Makuha mo ba Kayang Kuyakan At yakapin Sa pagtanda natin 
Nagtatanong lang sa'yo Ako pa kaya ibigin mo Kung maputi na ang buhok ko I don't walk on when your hair is white And I don't have a mind We'll laugh about those things When we dream of the past It will come right back Like the flowers every spring They won't believe us I say I just got lucky You took my hands to hold I'll give you my heart and soul Every day as the years unfold I promise I'll never let you go Ang aking pangako Na ang pag-ibig ko'y laging sa'yo I promise I'll Still be making you smile I promise I'll Never
All right, everyone, welcome back to your favorite. Uh, oh, Gio, what's up? I don't think that's our audience. Oh, the oh my gosh, I'm all so right. sorry. All right, sorry, man. Okay, <laughs> welcome back, everyone, to your most favorite regular programming. <laughs> yes. It's just so sad that it's so neat that we're going to end it already. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very close. Mm -hmm. But a really big but. Don't just leave yet. We still have more prizes yes. to give all of you and one more performances to close for this show. Exactly. But before all of those, may I just remind everyone to please check mm. your swag bags for this free pizza coupon, okay? So, mm -hmm. yeah, just... Yo, wait there. Question. Yeah. How can I redeem that pizza coupon? Good question, Gio. <laughs> so, you just need to show this pizza coupon to your local Pizza 73, okay? No other pizza places. Pizza 73. Just show this to them and you will get your free pizza meal. Mm -hmm. Alright. So, before we get into any more performances, we just wanted to introduce another door prize for <laughs> Not door our prize. beautiful audience. Okay, so whoever has commented their names will be winning these two wonderful door, door prizes. Door or prices. one of these two door prizes, yeah. sorry. I, have, I think we actually have already the first winner oh, already? for our mini eggs. Oh, wow. Card games prize. Wow. I think the, the prizes goes to... Drum roll. Jason Fred Dillon. Congratulations, Jason Fred. Always to remember, just wait for a youth worker to get in touch with you. Yes, awesome. And I think mm. for this next artsy prize, oh. we also have another winner, which is Bijiha Ahmed. Yes, okay. So, Bijiha, again, reminder to please just wait for your youth mentor to get in touch with you to get your prize. Okay. Uh, okay. So, now that we are ready to go back uh, to our regular programming, stick around because there is more, more, more. Ooh. But for now, folks, we will be putting a QR screen, um, a QR code on the <laughs> yeah. screen. I apologize. A QR code on the screen. So it's just a really short survey that you guys can do. And it's just for us to know what you have enjoyed. Mm -hmm. If there's anything you loved or you didn't like, then please, please fill out that survey. Mm -hmm. And in case the QR code is not working, there is also a link on the chat. <laughs> um, so you can click on that and it will take you directly on the survey. All right. Also, Bea, yes. if these people are so excited to win and participate in our survey, you have a chance to win our survey prizes. Oh. Yeah, we're not actually showing it right now because we want it to be surprised. Yes. So <laughs> what are they going to win? I wonder. Well, mm -hmm. you guys should fill out that survey and I you know. will see. I know. So all you have to do is enter your name at the bottom of mm -hmm. the survey. When you've completed it, it means you already have your ticket as an entrance. Yes, okay. And, mm -hmm, I think that's it for the survey prizes. So keep, 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 keep in touch with us for more of that. Awesome. And while, while <laughs> you're all doing your survey, here are some short videos for some of our amazing partner organizations, including the Immigrant Services Calgary, Trellis, Siwa, and finally a video from CBFY's other awesome program, our very own Swiss in school settlement program so enjoy hey folks my name is Hader hassan and i work at immigrant services gallery as their ceo welcome to the power of voice youth conference hosted by the bridge foundation for youth who's a near and dear partner of the work that we do at immigrant services gallery i'm reminded of my own journey as I speak to you today, when I was 15 years old, me and my family, we immigrated from Pakistan in 1999. And you name it, we went through all the trials and tribulations that you could imagine. My parents were struggling to find jobs. My younger brother and sister were trying to assimilate. So it was upon me to help with the settlement of my family. So I wish I had the superb team at the Bridge Foundation for Youth and the CEO Umashini Reddy, who I call my mentors. I have three messages for you. The first are relationships. Never undermine the power of relationships. If you are walking into a room post pandemic, of course, but virtually connect with people. 
Is there someone that you find interesting on LinkedIn or some of these social media that you want to be in the future? Reach out to them. Ask them how they got there and try to model and reverse engineer your way by building a relationship with them. And perhaps you can even seek a mentor like that. Because that's exactly what happened to me. Number two, reciprocity. When you deal with relationships in life, you will be going through debate and sometimes the debates would lead into you holding on to point A and the other person holding on to point B. Reciprocity means that neither A or B win, C win. And when you achieve C, both of you win. So that is reciprocity. Always find and, and make the room or wherever you go better than the way you found it. And finally, return on social investment. When you continue your leadership path today, you are going to achieve significant milestones. And when you get up there, it's time for you to come back to this exact forum and present your voice and inspire others. So the world is yours. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. So dream big. If you're slightly good in something, become world class so that you get noticed. And then sooner and later, an interesting phenomenon would happen. You'll be so good that they won't be able to ignore you and your voice. All the best. At Trellis, we work with children, youth, and families to unlock their potential and support their growth. Our programs focus on improving access to resources, developing family and community supports, and building the capacity to deal with future challenges. We're going to talk about some of our youth programs and how they can help youth in our community. Hi, I'm Ian. Hi, I'm Sherry. We're with Trellis Youth Employment. We help youth ages 12 to 24 get employment skills. We assist with resumes, cover letters, interview skills, and various work experience programs throughout the year. You can find us on Instagram at Trellis Youth Employment. My name is Maggie. I'm the case manager here at Building Youth Connections. I get to work with immigrant and refugee youth ages 12 to 24 um, and just walk with them in their life in Canada. So helping them with any questions they have, um, maybe navigating referrals, any support services that they're looking for. Um, and yeah, this is our office here, and we're here at, with our manager, Rob. Our clubs offer a safe and welcoming place for youth to come to after school while they make friends and participate in activities that encourage learning and discovery and health and well-being. We encourage physical activity, creative expression, leadership development, and a positive connection to community and family. Hi, my name is Kim. I'm a success coach through the All In For Youth program. Uh, what we are is we're a citywide school-based initiative with a goal of breaking down barriers to students' successful school completion. Uh, we have 11 success coaches in 25 schools and All In For Youth utilizes community partners for a collaborative approach to reduce high school dropout rates. The Youth Matters program has two offerings. We can set you up with a support worker to meet you one-to-one -one and work on any goals you may have and support you in managing your emotions and mental health. And Youth Matters can also offer you a variety of online and in-person interactive groups with like-minded youth if you'd like to connect with peers and make new friends. We aim to provide you with a safe space to be yourself and connect with peers, staff, and your community. Here at Agakuma, we welcome youth ages 12 to 21 and treat everyone like their family. When we're in person, we always have dinner, but things are a little bit different during the pandemic. We connect virtually now over Zoom. We do teachings with elders, video games, art projects, and learn about Indigenous ways of knowing and being. We focus heavily on inclusivity and everyone is welcome. We'd love for you to join our program. For youth that require long-term support, our youth housing programs provide customized support to assist each youth based on their individual needs. Through our youth shelter at AV15, we provide temporary or urgent support for youth experiencing or at risk of homelessness. These are just a sample of our programs, and we would love for you to learn more by visiting our website at www.growwithtrellis.ca or finding us on social media at trellisyyc.
Hi, welcome. I'm Peggy Mokarker, one of the supervisors of the Swiss program. The Swiss program supports and guides youth as they, as they settle and integrate into the new life in Canada. Our workers help you to become part of your community and the school and connect you through different services and activities, helping you to support and achieve your goals and dreams. Our workers also provide you with one-on-one -on -one support in your school and inform you about different topics through activities and workshops and also um, help you to transition through the complexities of this uh, new school system. Our program is free of cost and we provide it in different languages. We are really glad that you are here in the Power of Voice. We, have, we hope that you have a fantastic time here. Please connect with us and check our events. Contact us through Swiss at cbfy.ca. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Naya Chaba. I'm a graduate student in Bishop of High School. I obtained the in school settlement program for the warm welcoming to the newcomer student. I really feel at home and the different resources. Thank you. I'm calling a graduate student here at Bishop of and I appreciate the in school settlement program because I have someone to talk to about courses here and in post secondary and because of the settlement support for our family. Welcome back everyone again. <laughs> all right, I hope you all do your survey because as we promised earlier, we have a surprise. Prize. Yes. All okay, right. Gio, are we ready to show them? Okay, three, two, one. Woo! Woo! A free movie kit. Yeah, hot air popcorn popper. Yes, <laughs> all right, Gio. And I think we already have the winners yeah. for those people that have done their surveys. Mm -hmm. And who are they? The first winner for this prize goes to Dara Ajayi. Yes, Dara Ajayi. Congratulations, Dara. And of course, just a friendly reminder again, yes. wait for your youth worker to get in touch with you. Awesome. And the next person, Gio? The next person goes to, I mean, the next prize, not the next person, Dara. <laughs> <laughs> the next prize goes to Angeline Magnaye. Congratulations, Angeline, to a new hot air popcorn popper, which is you can use when you're watching Netflix shows. Yes, or <laughs> Disney, no. <laughs> no, oh yeah, and a friendly reminder again, keep in touch with your youth worker All for right. the details. <laughs> awesome, okay. And I think we have another winner of this prize, oh. Oh no, we're not done. We're not done. <laughs> oh my yet. God. Our next prize goes to the person who referred. And the, the last and final prize goes to someone who has referred others to join us to today's youth conference. Mm. And so here we have a bowl of those people that joined us. Oh, are you going to pick it? I can pick it. I, All right. I want to pick it. What, but okay. man, no cheating. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to uh, cheat. So everyone, I'm just going to roll it so you know, Bea doesn't really know what it is. <laughs> All right, Bea, for our referral, oops, referral, <laughs> prices goes to... <laughs> Abhishek Sewak! Woo! Congratulations! All right, Abhishek, yes, thank you so much for referring <laughs> others to this conference. Congratulations! So we hope you all get to enjoy the prizes. And for those that did not win this year, mm -hmm. no worries, because you will win the next youth conference. True. Awesome. There's always for next time. Yes. Don't give it up, because next year, we're always going to see you again. <laughs> yes, awesome, awesome. And, all right, folks, so we are at the end of the youth conference. But before we bid you all a goodbye, we just want to acknowledge that the special people who made this event possible this year. So thank you to IRCC for funding this awesome event. Thanks to everyone who donated prizes, as well as to all the organizations who has partnered with us today. And who are they, Gio? All right. Of course, Bea, a huge Thank you to all of our 
partner organizations, including EMFC, yes. Canada Bridges, UFC, SAIT, Youth Central, and Youth Employment Center, Trellis, Siwa, and of course, the Immigrant Services Calgary. Yes. Thank you all for all of your support that you given to us. From the deepest part of our hearts, Bea and I and all of the production team and all of all those people behind this event. Yes. Thank you yes. so much. All right. <laughs> and of course, you let us not forget all the wonderful performers that shared their amazing talents with mm -hmm. us. So let us give it up for Simran Preet, Ekamvir, Azmita, Love Preet, Casey, Miel, Hinok, Nico, Phoebe, Mark, Vlorden, Micah, Merville, Allen, and Echo. Yes. <laughs> yes. Last but definitely not the least, we also want to thank to all the companies that companies and organizations who donated prices on this event. Wow. They are very generous. Yes. You can even we, see the hot air pop right yeah. again. Without that, we would not be having this amazing movie, kids. <laughs> so thank you so much to the Heritage Park, the Rec Room Calgary, yes. the Next Page Bookstore, and Calgary Co-op, and of course, Pizza 73 for those awesome oh. Pizza 73 coupon yes. that has free pizza and pop. Yes, <laughs> awesome. So, all right, partner. Oh, partner. We are down to our last performance oh. of the day. Would you please do the honors of introducing them? All right. Hello again, everyone. <laughs> I just want to say- You never left. I no. never left. Never I'm left. still here. <laughs> we're still here. It's the last part, but we're definitely energetic. Yes. Again. All right. On behalf of the mentorship program and the whole CBFY organization, mm -hmm. my partner, Bea, she's over there. I'm, I'm right Spotlight here. on her. <laughs> and I, spotlight on me now, <laughs> would like to thank all of the people who attended this year's youth conference, The Power of Voice 2020. We know it was online, which is very yes. hard, but just a huge kudos to this, all of this team. Yes. They make it, they make this event a reality as well, right? They did, they really did. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say, this year's conference, it happened! Yes! <laughs> we we did, did it, folks! So I hope every one of us learned something today and you enjoy the performances, mm -hmm. swag, and everything we prepared for all of you. So for the last performance of the, of the night, of the night, of the night, the Hawaiian squad is back and will be closing the show for us. Yes! <laughs> and what are they going to be closing it with, Gio? All right, their last song will be, they're going to be serenading us with a moving song in Tagalog, mm -hmm. in Tagalog, oh. right? Called Huling Sayao. Oh, and what does that mean? It translates to, hmm, the last dance. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Again, my name is Gio. And I am Bea. And, and this, this is, is the Youth, Youth Conference, Conference Power of Voice, Voice 2021. 2021. We, we hope, hope to see you all, all next year. year. Good, Good night. night.
Kay Tamiz, Kay Sarap, Nunit Itona.